Happy Monday, everybody. Mm-hmm. How's everybody's uh, post-weekend day going? Well, uh, you know, it's it's gone okay so far. Good. Podcast. Took a walk. Mm. Listen to other podcasts that yeah. I'm working on. I'm at the point with Raise the Dead where literally I'm just listening to the episodes over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. Are you just finding like, are you finding stuff every time you listen? <sighs> yes. Okay. Then I mean that's the problem, is that I just keep I keep finding like, you sure. know. He left money in a bathroom stalls. Go mm-hmm. back and make sure stall. It's like, ah, oh, that fade was a little hot. Let me turn that down. Scotch. Mm-mm. So, yeah. Uh, hopefully, yeah. Uh, have everything ready to roll. But uh, what's it called? Tomorrow. Tomorrow on PX3, the the pre-release episode. Uh, first episode comes out. Exciting, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's nerve wracking. Yeah, yeah, a lot on the line. I mean, it could all end tomorrow. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, uh, it's just a lot of effort. I hope, uh, hope you don't screw up. That's so like my new gonna, thing. It's going to be good. You're going to be good. You, you, well, know, yeah. you know well enough that, like, at some point you just got to call it and hit publish. Yeah. Well, yeah. Because the more time you spend, the more time you spend fiddling with the actual thing, the less time you can spend making trailers or making promotional bits and getting it ready. To, like there are other things that you need to do once it's done that you need to make. Yeah. Sure yeah. Time I mean, that, the big stuff this week is all just getting everything, the product ready. So I'm pouring through the transcripts tonight to format that for the ebook and then, um, going through, uh, you know, I got to lock the audio book to submit that through ACX. Uh, uh, when you're done with the ebook, send whatever you want to me because I have vellum and I can print that as a make you a paperback version. Oh, awesome! Yeah, dude, cool. it does really, really like that's that was like uh, this layout was all vellum. Nice. Oh, nice. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, yeah, but that's, uh, what's going on? Cool. And you, you, you had a date for that, right? December 5th. December 5th. So a week from tomorrow, uh, the official feed launches, the ebook launches, the audio book launches. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, uh, yeah, it goes week by week until, uh, the beginning of, January. Cool. Very cool. But Everybody check it out. Six episodes and uh, seven if you get the ebook or the audiobook, which is uh, the bonus one is going to be all about the more, a, a bigger deep dive into the mob and Frank Sinatra and uh, the, the conflict between the Chicago mob and Bobby Kennedy in an open government hearing. Sweet. Welcome back, Brian. Okay, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I just, I, man, phones are useless now. Just anyone yeah, who answers the their worst. phone is a sucker. <sighs> oh, you mean actually like calling? Yeah, dude. Uh, what's funny is I'm, I'm curious where the trend of like, um, from a sales perspective, you probably A-B test a lot of stuff, but it's like, now the robo calls, it's always the exact same words. And I assume they're different companies, but maybe it's all the same company. The first words out of their mouth is open enrollment has begun. And well, then, yeah. I think that might, uh, I get that one a lot too. And that's, I, uh, there are like the, the healthcare.gov where I get my health insurance through, like legitimately does call you constantly about that. And you have to tell them, I got it. Please stop <laughs> telling me that I, so some number of these might be actual legitimate calls from the government? Uh, possibly, yeah. Wow. I mean, I've been throwing away all these IRS letters, and... 
I mean, I mean, I like that they're trying to attract my attention with all these red envelopes, but I just thought they were Netflix subscriptions. Yeah. <laughs> Process server. <laughs> right. All right, you guys want to do a show? Yeah. Yes. Let me uh, uh, show. Let me turn on the AC real quick. Okay. One more minute, everybody. about ready remember you can use the bang s command in the chat room to uh just share your ideas for what we should title the episode uh well i'm wearing a hoodie so it's a little it's a little hot for me all right we're all good here you good all right andrew take it away in three two hello and welcome to the weird things podcast i'm andrew main joined by justin robert young hi Brian Brushwood. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't hear you there. I was just listening to the new podcast from Justin Robert Young. <laughs> oh, Mr. Bryce Castillo, are you listening to the new podcast too? Ooh. <laughs> you know, I hear great things. I hear it's fantastic. <laughs> mainly mainly <laughs> from me, constantly, nonstop, all day. <laughs> uh, gentlemen, um, I want to dive right into... Well, apparently we've seen the future of transportation, and it looks a lot like the <laughs> 1980s idea of the future of transportation. Oh, my God. I can't wait to get your take on this whole thing because there are so many victories. For those of you who don't know, Elon Musk introduced his new amazing electric uh, truck called the Cybertruck. Uh, it is, shall we say, a bold design with bold claims made about various parts of its structure, and uh, there was a bold shall we say, unplanned element <laughs> to the demo he the did. Demonstration, right? You know, you always want to make sure some of the most uh, uh, amazing, iconic moments happen during a physical demonstration. Steve Jobs, of course, the master of this, pulling out the iPod from his pocket, slipping out the first MacBook Air from a manila envelope, things that are undeniable to our visual senses. And man... Did uh, Tesla uh, shoot for the moon by trying to demonstrate their bulletproof windows by throwing a gigantic metal ball into them? And uh, what happened, Andrew? So they t Elon had been talking about coming out with a truck for a long time. The Tesla was going to do a truck. And a truck is a great area you want to get into if you want to do transportation. So much of commercial transportation uses trucks. The Ford F-150, you know, is, is you know, maybe arguably the Conestoga wagon of, you know, contracting and a lot of other. I mean, it's 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 a it's a significant vehicle. So getting to that space is pretty a pretty solid idea. So he'd been teasing the idea of a cyber. He didn't tell us it was a tr cyber truck until recently, but this futuristic thing. And he kept saying it looks like something out of Blade Runner. It's going to look crazy. And people are like, yeah, yeah, OK. And you'd see concept drawings that were a little bit crazy. You know, a little bit, little bit like kind of like, you know, really slanted, you know, front ends and whatever, whatnot. And then at an event that, that opened up, started off like a David Copperfield show. I mean, there were lasers and everything and smoke machines and stuff. I'm like, man, this is really well produced and really well planned. <clears throat> and then uh, <laughs> Elon announces the truck and the truck rolls on stage and reactions. Well, you've all seen the reactions to it. They're from, oh, my God, this is cool to what is this to you know, uh, anger to laughter. I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> it's a very, uh, divisive design. We'll put it that way. Okay. And so Elon goes on, talks about how it's made from, you know, it's made from this, this new, this stainless steel that's extremely strong. And he does a demo. He first, they bring out a door from a regular truck and they slam it with a sledgehammer and show how easily they can dent it. And so then uh, Elon has uh, his chief designer, Franz von Holshausen, come out there and say, hey, hit the door of the Cybertruck with it. So he takes the sledgehammer back. He looks a little hesitant, but he goes in, and slams it. Door's fine. But Elon's before like, we get to this, we're, we're, we're seeing the footage of like, I just don't know that any of the audio listeners can really wrap their mind around just how there were lasers uh, constantly firing during the entire event i mean the pyrotechnics old, colored light the only thing missing is the trans-siberian orchestra playing some amazing metal christmas music from this <laughs> thing. And, and genesis vibe and and by the way i mean look uh tesla doesn't buy advertising 
this is their advertising. They yeah. rely on word of mouth, and so there is a reason why we're watching a hologram now of a, uh, uh, you know, a, a digital sprite speaking to the audience. Uh, it is a, a certainly something that they rely on. That they want to make, they want to dominate news uh, while this is happening. So, so he he has he has Holzhausen hit the door once. Elon's like, do it again twice. Well, and and, and he threw uh, specifically what a giant uh, steel ball bearing, right? Well, he's We're talking about the yet. sledgehammer We're moment first. We're not, yeah. not even happy. Oh, so he, got it. He's, he's hitting the door with a sledgehammer. He hits the door with a sledgehammer. Once and then I'll oh, do it again. He does it again. And like, oh no, do it one more time. So he hits the door again with a sledgehammer. And I'm watching this going like, your chief designer looks a little uncomfortable hitting the door this many times with the sledgehammer. And then they say, hey, let's talk about the glass now and how it's like impact resistant, whatever. And they have this demo with this 20 foot tall, this tent, you know, big huge tube where they drop the ball through the tube and it hits a sheet of glass, one of their their glass to show how resistant it is, etc. Um, which is this, you know, neat demo. Again, it looks like a David Copperfield illusion. You know, watch as we put the steel ball through here, okay? Then he asks Holzhausen and says, I want you to hit the window. I want you to go ahead and hit the window of the Cybertruck that they just pounded the door three times with a sledgehammer with. And I'm going like, all right. And then Holzhausen grabs that ball, throws it at the front window, and... Smash. Chat. He really... <laughs> uh... <sighs> Man, even on the first throw, he kind of lobbed looked like it. Like he was pulling his throw a little bit. Well, I don't think he wants it to ricochet and hit the audience. Sure, but then also, uh, <laughs> I think my favorite part is you can hear uh, Elon muttering under his breath, "Oh my F and G." <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, so as soon as that happened, I texted my buddy Ken, who was watching this. I said. The sledgehammer cracked the glass. Like they, 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 when they did this demo, I don't think they did the two things together. And then later on, he released video where they showed them same truck beforehand throwing the ball against the glass. And then he said, Yep, sledgehammer cracked the door and cracked the base of the glass. I'm like, Well, yeah, this is why you got to do these demos together. <laughs> Wait, now, would that explain why the back window also cracked? You hit that 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 body is solid steel, so the vibration of that sledgehammer is getting absorbed by the whole thing. So we're watching video right now of them showing there's like him him hurling the ball at the glass beforehand. Yeah, which I mean, it know. looks like it works. Um, God, it, it, but the optics, it's it's optics, maybe. <laughs> I mean, okay, so there is yeah. some contingency of Twitter that is convinced that this was all an intentional conspiracy. That the whole idea is. Hey man, otherwise this would have been a slightly notable car thing, but this was all orchestrated to get all of us talking about it. But man, here's the thing. Look, look at the Pontiac Aztec. The, the Pontiac Aztec was a bold design with a bunch of functional, cool things about it. Uh, it, it, it turned into a tent or whatever, but it was slightly too bold. There's something about the way we buy cars that makes us very nervous about ever being laughed at. And uh, as a result, it was only after the failure of the Pontiac Aztec that that was decided that that would be the car of Walter White on Breaking Bad to define his practical dorkiness. Um, man, I feel like they lost more sales than they gained by having the image of this car involve two baseball-sized shatter points on it. Well, all right. So, so I think that there's there's two kind of vectors to that. Number one, was this done deliberately to uh, uh, to to you know drive the talking points? While it is indeed true that they do not buy advertising, they need people to be talking about this as much as possible. I am am in the camp that they would have generated a lot of talking points, including uh, uh, if they want to mine. The, the 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 derisive nature that much of the internet uh, uh, treats Elon Musk with, uh, they would have gotten that just with the the design of the uh, car itself, right? Because it is Agreed. bold. It is something that that people would have wound up talking about. So I do not think that they intentionally smashed the the glass. That being said, I am with you on the Aztec example. The only difference I would say is that the Aztec was launched as a consumer car 
right? It was at a price that they wanted to move a lot of units on. The one thing that I can say about the Cybertruck, but by the time that it actually hits, I wonder whether or not, because it stands out, people aren't going to be paying fifteen, twenty thousand for this. This is going to be a thirty-five, forty thousand dollar vehicle. Whether or not it's more like the Escalade or or something like that, where it's like it's it is a big ostentatious design that anybody who's spending that amount of money wants to damn well be sure that everybody on the block knows that it's them. So I, 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 I'm a fanboy, and I would love to believe that that was a planned, but no, no. I, <laughs> and, and you can see Elon after when that happened, he, in his head, he's seeing the tweets and the memes gonna, that are going to happen that are that he's, he can already hear the short sellers and everything else doing that. Um, I, I, I do not think, but I mean, it's funny that people, you know, we come to that, you know, some people come to that conclusion because it got a ton amount of press. Here's the, you know, the interesting, there was an article about how did the Pontiac Aztec happen? And it's fascinating because it starts off how they showed at a car show years before their concept of what they wanted this thing to be. And it was a much better looking, neat looking kind of crossover kind of vehicle before crossovers became a more popular sort of product line. And it sounded in, in abstract kind of cool, but then it went from design, you know, change to change to change to being become the thing that it was. And then like put it on a, on a less powerful body or less powerful frame and all this sort of stuff. And then all the compromises came in and then this thing came out and it was just, I remember I had a friend that had one of those. I'm looking at this going like, what is, why? But, you know, obviously, you know, we, whenever somebody tries to do something very different in the car market, we look for comparisons and most of the comparisons we think of are, are things that are failures. And because we look at like, when you try to be too different, then, you know, we either, it's either because it was not a good idea to be too different or whatnot. I would say the real secret of the test of, of the cyber truck is forget the way the truck looks. It's all about that. It's all about the, the, the frame. It's all about the motors and the, you know, and the battery system, the tech like there he can have his design studio design it to look like anything. What matters is how powerful that thing is. And I think that's what's, you know, going to be, can they actually deliver it for the price they said? I mean, that $40,000 starting price of $40,000 for something that's bigger than an F-150 that's more powerful, that has all of that. I hope so, you know, but it seems like, man, it feels like uh, a, a lot of promising once you get past the look of it. But people are in who are, on the inside said that it's super spacious, really roomy, and also people I've talked to who've been up to it saw it in person said that it looks very different up person, that it's more impressive and whatnot. But yeah, I think it's gonna. Cool. I, I I gotta be honest, like in the back of my head, uh, I th I think I would have seriously considered it, uh, but 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 that demo man, like just driving around and everybody picturing like, hey man, where are the two smash? Like, there's gonna be decals that you put on the window that mimic uh, those two smashes or whatever. Well, we'll, That's a real unfortunate part years. of the story. Yeah, people, I would, it won't be out for two years. So. I, I would I would agree with Andrew there. I think that by the time we're gonna we're gonna have so many more Elon Musk memes by the time that this thing actually rolls out. Uh, that that. Who knows? I, I I think that that was, it was a big moment for the announcement. It will certainly be something that will make the highlight reel. And uh, as the fate of Tesla and Elon Musk go whatever directions, should it turn south, we will that will always be the B roll footage, right? Mm -hmm. Like if 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 Tesla ever went bankrupt, that's gonna be the thing that plays on repeat uh, while they are covering the story. But. I don't know. I think that this is, it's such a monumental purchase. I mean, it's a car purchase uh, and it, it's so distinctive that I, I kind of feel like by the time that it rolls out, this will be more about, do I want to drive a RoboCop car than do you remember the time that the, that the windows got smashed? And he's, he's talked about before this came out says, you know, we may have to use a more conventional design that this is too radical so, like, you know, the the critical part about that company is their ability to manufacture batteries in bulk, motors, and all the drivetrains and all that stuff. And they can do a lot. Like, the Model Y is on top of the Model 3 drivetrain. This drivetrain, you can put anything on top of there, you know, so, or around I, it. Using... I was kind of surprised they didn't go with a flatbed pickup, like yeah. a, a, an open pickup. That was, that was something that, you know, if you want to get into that market, like, that's standard. You know, that well, is that can I, 
classic for a reason. I think the strategy is going to be that I, I think that they know they can only build so much while they ramp up production, basically building the assembly line to build this because, you know, they're, they're kind of maxed out of the throughput they can do for the Model 3 right now. And I think that when they start building the product, you know, it takes a long time to ramp up to be able to make sure these things deliver without the doors falling off and whatnot, which we've seen previously. I kind of think that this, like I said, because it's about the drivetrain and everything else, is I think that this is probably a really good early adopter vehicle. You're going to get, you know, they've, they, he says they've had already 200,000 people who've, you know, put down a hundred dollar deposit to pre-order or whatever. And I think that that's a really good thing to get the momentum going for the factory, but that factory that could then spit out a more conventional truck too. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we will, uh, we will see. Uh, uh, so Brian, did you put down a reservation? I thought about it. Uh, the uh, I saw them touting the fact that they had made uh, what was it? I think two hundred thousand dollars in pre reservations or 200, whatever. Two hundred thousand orders. What's that? Two hundred thousand orders. Yeah, two hundred thousand orders. orders. Okay, well that's yeah. significantly better. That's what twenty million dollars in the bank. Um, yeah, uh, I, I, I to be honest, I've said this before, uh, all the way back to me sporting wacky video game looking hair. I think the world should be more wacky than it currently is. And and if we live in a world that is, you know, just wacky enough where these kind of trucks are driving around all over the place, I'm a happy person. <laughs> we are watching now a, a, a mashup of Magic's biggest secrets finally revealed uh, with the Mass Magician. Oh, that's from friend of the show, Mass Kate Raft. Oh, my goodness. That's amazing. Yeah, they. I think they were they were watching this on Jack AM and mashing up the uh, the glass shattering with the uh, the car crush uh, <laughs> magic. <laughs> oh my god! It's cutting just... to the masked magician. This is so good. Yeah, that's hilarious. <laughs> uh, but yeah, all right. So so Brian, uh, I have not put down a reservation because I don't own a car. Uh, Andrew, did you put down a reservation? What do you think? Uh, you yes. definitely well, did. Of course. You totally I did. Fact that uh, you did. I got I got to tell you, what's funny is the only thing that keeps me from, I mean, you know, I don't know. Forgive me. This is, in the grand scheme of things, $100 to grab your spot in line, that seems pretty reasonable. But it's like, uh, I, I, I'm sort of increasingly buying into the Jeep culture right now. So I, I'm, it's like, it's too late for me, Andrew. Godspeed. <laughs> Enjoy your truck. I hear you. I, it's not, and I'm looking at this going like, I can't even put this in my garage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look, so, by then you'll have, I got a, two a, years a, to figure that out or more. Yeah, man, you, you get a new place. You'll figure this out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I, I love the fact that it probably was not market tested. You know, I love the fact that it was a, Hey, let's do something really, really crazy. go out there with something very bold and and I and I believe two years from now that truck's going to look a lot more normal. Plus, also, uh, I wouldn't be surprised at all if the new norm is to have crazy wraps on it. Like I, I could see a yep. whole secondary industry of like, what video game crazy stuff do you want? You want it to look like a Borderlands car? Great, we could do that. You want it to look like a car from this game, that game, the other game? Uh, it, it 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 it's sort of it's utilitarianism. On the one hand, ends up looking superfluously uh, cyberpunky, but I think at the at the end of the day, that's part of the reason that the price is, and forgive me for saying this about a $50,000 automobile, uh, it's astonishingly low for, for as, as bold a design as it is. Yeah, there, there have been some uh, concept stuff that's put out there. Some rap companies already said they're going to do it. I saw the ones where it looked like in black and with white looked good it actually looked like a different sort of for some reason just getting away from that steel i don't know if, you, if that's available bryce if you look for like uh, if you can yeah, pull I, up the I, image I of that i feel like the steel was meant to be evocative of like a delorean and unfortunately there's baggage in the delorean whereas i guess yeah, the yeah i think version, if it was if it was in black it would look way better yeah because then it's evocative yeah. of a batmobile right yeah yeah, we're looking at a black wrapped, you know, Photoshop right now, and that looks pretty cool. Well, I think to, well, also because the Starship, it's made from the same steel as the use, using for Starship. So for him, it's the idea of, you know, doing that. But yeah, the other thing that's cool is there's video showing how the, the cover goes on the on the truck bed, 
how it slides up and over. And it's actually super hypnotic. Apparently, they say you could stand on it. Because for me, I was looking at it like, that looks like a roller shade. And like, it's going to make noise if you go fast. But apparently, it slides over. And they say that because there's enough surface area, they're going to put, they'll have one of the solar panel option, which will only give you maybe like 15 miles per day. But it's still kind of a neat idea because if you don't drive a whole lot. So is that, oh, okay. So it is kind of a roller shade type thing where it's segmented, uh, uh, kind of like your, you would seal up your bodega in the middle of downtown Manhattan. Yeah. As you do. Just hope those damn graffiti artists don't come by. And <laughs> So then I guess then, then the tailgate comes down and that's how you get into the, into the, into bed. the bed. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the tailgate pulls down into a ramp. Oh, it's because they also unveiled an ATV, and they showed you know they have the Tesla ATV, and they showed the guy drive the ATV up the ramp, then plug it into the truck to charge. Yeah, I mean, look, I I, I agree with you. I, I think when you, when you first look at it, you're like, oh my god, that's crazy. It looks like a, a PlayStation One render of uh, a vehicle. It's super weird. Uh, I tend to think when I when I saw the video of people like driving it, I'm like, oh, nobody will mistake what that is. And it does look menacing. And so it's like if you're gonna spend money on that kind of car, then yeah, I think that, that there's there is a market for like I want a badass truck that everyone knows is badass that doesn't look like an F-150. Oh, I think that's what they're going for. We're watching more of the footage, and it just breaks my heart that we're now on to the part of the presentation where the star of the show is the fact that they have an ATV that goes in the back, and you just don't see anything but those cracks in the windows. <laughs> you would think you would think that, like, uh, were this an Apple presentation, they would have said, like, uh, see, it didn't go through. That was what we intended. All right, get this one off, bring on the real one, and then continue with I... the demo. But instead, they had to continue with that one with the giant cracks. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yep. it is it is definitely going to be a thing that people will continue to talk about with this. Well, those lasers do look cool. Hey, you want to know what else is cool? Supporting us at patreon.com slash weird things. If you add on over to patreon.com slash weird things, you can make sure that we keep doing this show each and every week live on Mondays. Folks, we appreciate your support. Patreon.com slash weird things. So have you heard about the using in brain chips to deal with like opioid opioid addictions? No, uh, the closest I've heard about this is uh, Parkinson's disease. Uh, electrical stimulation apparently has had some significant effects in reducing palsy uh, in the in the hands of uh, Parkinson's folks. Uh, uh, what, 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 uh, separately, I guess the closest I've heard of is there was also an implant down by the stomach that used electrical impulses to reduce the uh, hunger pangs. And they originally wanted to do it as, a, as, as an alternative to the lap band or uh, gastro bypass surgery. Uh, but they figured out that this little electrical stimulation only, only dropped 15 to 20 pounds in most people. So now it's being tested for, for kind of like mid-level, like somebody just trying to Google and get my stomach chip now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but, 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 but this is the first I've heard of this one. What, what's the story on this one? So they're doing the first U S clinical trials of a chip an in brain chip designed to fight opioid addiction. And it works by sending little signals to certain parts of the brain. And we've been, Using in-brain chips to do things, as you pointed out, we've been doing for decades. You know, Michael Crichton wrote the book Terminal Man, which talked about like the 70s, you know, the, some of the early, you know, work on that. And it's a very interesting area because we know that you can, you know, the brain has a physical component and you can trigger things and you can do things by prodding and poking. And for some people, you know, opioid addiction is extremely severe. It rewires the brain and as a way to sort of combat that, um, I'm cautious, but super hopeful that this might be, you know, we could be moving into a future where you have, like you point out, Brian, that you might do the stomach chip and you might do the brain chip and you might do these other things. And, you know, there could be, you know, two attitudes on it, which would be like, oh, why do we have to do that? But the other point is, is that, you know, we're fighting evolution in an environment we weren't designed for. This is a yeah. really, oh, sorry, go ahead, Justin. Well, you know, I, I just, it, when when you are around addiction, you you quickly realize that it the the 
patterns of addicts are far similar than uh, whether or not they share the same thing that puts them into these patterns of behavior. So being around a alcoholic or an opioid addict or a gambling addict, something like that, uh, you realize that the, the, the ways that they interact with the world are far similar to each other, which has always kind of led me to the belief in the science to the idea that like you are watching people rewire their brains and, and you are reacting to stimuli, you are reacting to a pattern of behavior that then leads you into the the dissolution of the, the elements of your lives. So if there is a way, if there is a brain hack <laughs> that can effectively reset that cycle, because that's all you're ever looking for. And in, in, in a 12-step program, in uh, uh, ways that you, you know, is, is it Narcan or whatever, but like chemical ways that you can try and get to this, all you're ever hoping for is a break in a pattern and the reestablishment of a new pattern. And that is so much of you fighting against your own brain. If this is a way that you can do that more effectively, I don't think it's a one-stop cure, but man, that would be a powerful tool. Well, and there are pharmaceuticals that reduce our craving for cigarettes and, and make us feel physically ill when we encounter alcohol and stuff. So I have a game I want to play. I'll try to make it as short as possible. But let's start with what I think everybody in this room generally agrees is a good thing, is whether it's a chip or a pharmaceutical a thing that breaks the cycle of addiction to somebody and allows them to return back to society. We all agree that's good, right? Yes. Uh, Not for my alcohol and my opiate stocks, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> correct, correct. But then, but then here's the game that's fascinating to me. Um, whether it's a perf performance-enhancing pharmaceutical or a chip in the brain, how do we feel if, for example, Elon Musk or some other high-powered CEO was using it in order to maximize his work. Like, hey, I went in, I got a surgery, I got a chip in my brain now. Good news, I only sleep four hours a night. Odds are I'll die 10 years earlier, but uh, according to all metrics, my creativity is up 35%, my cognitive uh, ability, my communication, blah, blah, blah. All of these things are, are vastly enhanced. How do we feel about that at a gut level, at, a, at a sort of a, a base morality level? I mean, I think this is happening. <laughs> like yeah, well, and, some... and, we, and we have. We've heard about CEOs microdosing on LSD or, or what have you. Uh, or even just like people that, taking Adderall. That's, that, yeah, that's that's something that I think we've we've, you know, however people are medicating themselves to the point where they believe they're getting peak efficiency is is one thing, but you know, I had a friend of mine who got, you know, way too drunk and then wound up calling a service uh, after he was hung over for like the second day. That basically was a guy that would come in with the uh, saline drip bags, uh, hook you up and rehydrate you. And uh, this dude was telling a story about how most of his work comes from executives throughout San Francisco because they're the ones that can afford after they get super trash to just have a dude roll by in the morning or before they go to sleep to be rehydrated. So they wake up at six o'clock when they're at their, you know, there for the power jog or anything else that they're going to do because they want to maintain a certain level of, uh, of optimization. So I don't suspect that for that crowd, there is ever going to be a limit for how they can unlock the most of their potential per day. So, on the one hand, uh, I think certainly when we're looking at pharmaceutical enhancement or chip enhancement, let's let's say it's a robot chip put in somebody's brain that makes them crave working out or crave training or whatever. So it's like if somebody's getting ready to compete with the Olympics, Olympics, I have to imagine that chips enhancing your brains for the purposes of enhanced training would be outlawed, right? Like like I think universally that would be frowned upon. Uh, I don't know. I mean, that would be an, an interesting question, and that it would it would bring into the idea of all right, is the Olympics regulating of uh, of intensity uh, of of preparation? Well, and there's, I was at a party once, and it was a, mostly academics, and these were really high achieving people from you know established universities, et cetera, and people done you know stuff you may have heard of, and the subject of like Ritalin came up. 
and I'm sm- talking to a small group of people there, and they're all like, oh, yeah, I use it. Oh, yeah, I would use it from t-. And they're all over 40, and that may have been part of a fact that they're all like, oh, yeah, use it, use it, use it. And I was sort of like baffled because some of these people were in the neurosciences and stuff and all that, but they're like to a person. They're all like have used it or periodically would use that as – you know, to get their work done. And I think that as far as uh, the problem is, is you can say, hey, we're going to ban such and such a thing. But like if Brian, if you were, you know, you were an Olympic athlete, you're a rower or something like this in your off season, if we put you on a cycle of steroids for, you know, four months, five months, whatever, and then took you off of it, you will have gains and you'll have performance increases that we won't be able to detect when it comes time to test. Hang on, let me and get a pen. That's going to be Feels you know, like a modern rogue episode. <laughs> <laughs> and that's going to be a thing we're getting into is like some of the stuff is hard to detect. You have you have the Russians really good at doping. Then we figured out a lot of the tricks the Russians were doing. Now you have we've had you know the Chinese who have immense technological capabilities and a huge reason to try to use you know state driven means to do this. Um, they can probably outthink you know, the anti-doping community, or they can actually outthink a lot of the methods there. Cause a lot of the people who are working on those committees are then going back to their home countries and saying, this is how we know how to do this. This is what they can't test for. This is what's going on here. And you could do the brain chip thing and you would never know, you know, how would you test for that? And also it's like, you know, so. sure. Well, and, and I suppose what I'm dialing in on, and this is a thought that I've not really considered before is in the case of athletes, we have a predominant sense of what we want is fairness, right? And we feel like whether it's pharmaceutical or I suspect that a chip or whatever, like an unfair advantage, like um, uh, uh, wasn't it, uh, 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 what's his name, was blood doping, you know, putting in fresh oxy- oxygenated blood, uh, uh, live, st- live strong guy. Oh. Lance Armstrong. Yeah, that was, uh, was it EPO? Uh, I think was was the thing he was accused on that was that was running rampant throughout the cycling world. Right. And then separately, we hear about, you know, folks like Peter Thiel having the blood of younger people injected in them on the CEO side. And all of these things sort of subvert our sense of fairness, uh, as as Jonathan Haidt would say, our moral taste bud about uh, uh, fairness and and cheating. Um, But then how how would we feel about firemen? getting a chip in their head that made them more alert and better able to do their jobs. So for some reason, the idea of a fireman, even pharmaceutically speaking, like, like I, I, I think as a citizen, well, our, our fighter pilots, our fighter pilots are using speed. I mean, that that's, that's a, Sure, sure, sure. And, and I guess that that's sort of settled territory. So I hadn't really you know, like like we all agree when we're at war, whatever, use all the chemicals, just, you know, defeat but, the but other guy, whoever war. the other guy is. I mean, is. that's the thing. And we don't know how much does that carry over to the commercial space. And so and that's sort of the thing. If, if we know that our our, you know, our Air Force aviators, Navy aviators are given, you know, pet pills, speed pills, all this as a regular basis, they're given this sort of stuff because it's measured. We know the effects. It's better when they're on it when they're not. Uh, presumably. And like, yeah, I think like, you know, would I want my doctor to be using a chip that would make sure that he's not going to forget a sponge inside of me while he's operating me or might reduce hand tremors or something? Sure. Sounds good. I I want that guy. And I guess, I guess to a certain extent, oh, that's interesting. So it's like, if you had a choice uh, through pharmaceuticals, if you're about to go under the knife, would you rather he be on a pharmaceutical that is proven to enhance attention, cognition, and precision or not? Would you rather have your doctor be high or not high if, if it's the appropriate high while working on you? Well, and this also assumes that there's no side effects, no crash, no lung. Right? Sure, sure, like, sure, sure. You, you, but, you also don't want a junkie doctor who's not on his stuff. Correct. You know. Correct. Yeah, I had that once. <laughs> um, and it's, I had, a, I had a dentist that was like, I, I best that guess I could guess he was coked out. It was, it was really weird. You know, um, it was unnerving, but, uh, my, <laughs> Hold my, on. my time, like, whoa, 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 whoa. How much, yeah, you don't have to give his name, but I feel like ah. there's a story here that I just want to cozy in on. I, I needed a dentist. This was in Florida. I go there and I, <laughs> I, 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 I you Florida. You have me at Florida. All right. I, I go sit down in the chair and he comes. It's like, all right, let's take a look here. Let's take a look. All right. Okay. All right. Open up your mouth there. And he goes, oh, wow. He's he goes, muttering. That's, that's, a, what, that's, that's, what, that's what Coke addicts do is they mutter the word cocaine under their breath all the time. 
He goes, he looks at my mouth and goes, oh, that's a, that's really effed up in there, you know? And then he's like, all right, cool. I'll, I'll be right back. And, you know, he's so twitchy and so this. I'm like, like I'm just, there's nobody in the room. I'm just sort of like, like, this guy's like on coke. This is like, <laughs> you know, and he just turns out medical professionals, shocker, high use of cocaine. Who yeah, knew? <laughs> th- th- there's definitely uh, two groups of people that, that in my casual acquaintances are most comfortable Ha, uh, uh, dabbling in, in pharmaceutical arts. Uh, one, of course, is medical professionals, doctors especially, but also, I assume, dentists and, and nurses and so on. And then the other is lawyers. It's as though yep. because they're so intimately familiar with the downsides, both legal and, and uh, physical, they, they, uh, they feel like they're uniquely qualified to play with fire. Yeah, I think there's uh, it's a whole other discussion there as far as like yeah like where how rampant that is and what's considered those norms, uh, but but to Bryce's point like yeah Bryce I agree with you that the, the concern is we want to make sure that if this is a thing that's used that we really know that it works because the pharmaceutical industry is like any other industry it maximizes profit it wants to sell you a product and it will do whatever it can to derive the maximum benefit from said product and if that means cherry picking studies are pushing something through in a ne- very narrow way, you know, um, you know, we, we got to be vigilant about that and make sure and figure out that do these things work. So uh, the, the, the one thing I am just to go back to the addiction side, I am very excited to see where we go with, you know, that pattern breaking that, that, that possible idea of like, all right, uh, uh, your rehab begins with us chipping you and then, you know, we're, we're going to slowly then, I mean, basically the, the, if there was a concept of rehab that did not, that, that was able to speed up the trauma of we're going to break your brain. And the majority of the rehab was spent try, uh, then trying to reestablish. I think that would be, that would be fascinating. It'd be very interesting to see that. Yeah. So I, um, I, I guess, from our discussion that there there's no because immediately the parallel all of us are drawing are yeah it's pretty much like a like a pill only it's a chip so there's there's no like free pass that it gets by being a physical stimulation of chemicals in your own brain that uh like it might as well be a pill well i mean in my mind you know if you look at the there are the pills that you have for opioid addicts now that are effective, right, or, or medications uh, for that that basically try to do part of this, but then also make either you know alcohol or opioids physically painful, which is different in my mind than if you were able to break the pattern in your head and therefore you were trying to suppress the initial just like the, the signals to say that you want this, as opposed to training your brain to say no, 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 no. Whenever you get this there's going to be tremendous physical pain involved. And so you're trying to rewrite your brain's behavior from there. I mean, to be honest, I, I don't know what would be more effective, but uh, I think this would be very interesting to watch. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the advantage over a pill, is, Brian, is like your point, it's the precision is the idea. You kind of, we, we theoretically know specifically where it's acting, where, you know, pills and other stuff and other treatments can sometimes affect, you know, you can, you can only measure so many things when you do clinical trials to see how much they affect. Yeah. I guess, I guess this is the futurist in me trying to come out, uh, where I'm thinking to a future where let's say that a chip does evade stigma, the, the same stigma that, that pharmaceuticals have right now. And so at first it's used to treat addiction, then it's used for, People who have very important jobs, whether it's soldiers or firemen or, or uh, police officers or doctors. And then at some point, I, I guess I'm believing that, oh, you're about to become a parent. Well, are you going to get chipped? It's what's best for your kids. It'll raise your ability to you know, stay dialed in on them and, and give them focus and do the reading and all the best practices. So are, are you a good parent or a bad parent when it comes to you know, getting, getting chipped for it? Let me, let, me, let me ask you this, Brian. Let's bring it back to some OG weird oh, things. Oh, torturing Terry. my family, yeah. Uh, you have girls that are now, at least two, two of your girls are now getting into the standardized test phase of their schooling that that there are now 
tests that that you know, especially for for Penny, she's going to be getting into the realm of SATs or, or ACTs, whatever uh, the whatever's in fashion yeah, she, now. She, she's in that pre qualifying for college stays stage right now. Yeah. So those are very important, you know, as anybody who's gone through a college admissions process is. Can you imagine a world where you would sign off on, hey, it's a temporary chip, but especially because so much relies, so much pressure is put on a young mind to test well. Is that something that you could see yourself being okay with? Um, I mean, 100%, although the only word I would quibble with in what you just said was the idea of temporary, because if it works in the short term, and it's sustainable in the long term, and it corrects, uh, you know, uh, uh, frustrating or bad or, or antisocial uh, behaviors, or uh, gets the best out of like it's still as as they say. I man, uh, by the way, as a project, I'm going to go back and rewatch Gattaca and see how it holds up. If any of you guys want to join me, please do. But I'm going to show it to my kids. Um, there's that moment in Gattaca where they say, "No, no, no, this is still your child. It's just the best of both of you." And yeah. um, uh, it, it, it doesn't help in this example, the fact that my oldest is, as, as they say, twice gifted, which means she's wicked, wicked smart, but, uh, but, but also has some complications that come along with that. So if, if we could justify, kind of hide behind the, oh, we're correcting this aspect of it, and along with it, getting the most out of the other thing. But I guess we, yeah. we already see that with, with kids who are diagnosed ADHD and so on. So yeah, let's let's imagine this is this is not a forever solution. This is a uh, uh, you know this you only get one Super Bowl, and that is taking your qualifying test. Considering how overweighted and important it is in our in our modern education system, so this will make you very dialed in. It probably has measurable uh, 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 downside effects of connection to family or friends, but the science is the science you're going to get, you know, some ridiculous, you know, let's say in the, in the SAT parlance, you know, 400 points on average difference between what you would have before just by being able to turn off these outside focuses, uh, these outside distractions. Yeah. I suppose I'm already doing that in terms of, I know the best, I know that self breaking Brian announced some weird experiments going on in his household. No, <laughs> yeah. I mean, there, there sort of is an experience in that, uh, it's, it's, it's de rigueur for everybody to say, limit your kid to so many hours of screen time or whatever. And I gotta be honest, you know, I, I was the kid who, you know, had nonstop screen time in an age before the internet. I was constantly on bulletin board systems, uh, connecting with other people. Now in the early days, I funneled all of that into, uh, no, anti-social activities like like pirating content or whatever, but also learned an awful lot about what it takes to communicate with the world and to build up social credit. And all of that has ended up benefiting me now in my mid forties as we, as we go forward. So as my daughter has her, her entire social life is online. So when she goes up to her room and locks herself self off for screen time, I know that the conventional wisdom is limit that screen time, get her out in the real world or whatever. But I strongly suspect that all that will do is make her miserable and yield nothing in terms of, of real friendships. I think her real friendships are her online friendships as is evidence right here. The vast majority of all the time I've spent with, with both of you guys has been online and I don't, I don't feel like our friendship is any less real. And I feel like all of us are better equipped to handle the fast paced changes in the 21st century as a result of all the screen time we're doing. So, so in some ways I'm, we're, we're, going against the grain. We're swimming upstream and, uh, I, I don't know whether I'm right or not, but, but I, I yeah. suspect I am. Screen time is such a horrible phrase. Cause it's like, ah, I took my, you know, I took my device. My friend uses, my son uses to chat with his friends from school and socialize away. And now he's upstairs reading Dungeons and Dragon manuals by himself. So much better. I mean, right. Not yeah. that's really <laughs> long, but, but you're like, you're like, does that a win? Yeah. You know? <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, I, I, yeah, I, I, I don't know, I guess, is, is my answer to it. But but I, I suspect that in a reduced version, we're already running that experiment. All right, let me let me play this game, okay? Because um, I can tell you my answer to a lot of these. 
I'm going to announce product reveals for new chips. And imagine they just came out, but they said, you know, we actually military tested. We know these things work. We're going to get rid of the questions of whether or not they're safe. We'll say that, yeah, they're super safe. You can pull them out, blah, blah, blah. Uh, who wants to be the first one here to sign up for? Oh, we got a chip that reduces the amount of sleep you need, but apparently it increases the quality of your sleep. So a five-hour sleep is more like a 10-hour sleep, regenerative, whatever. We've, we we modeled after people who we find out have extreme longevity, et cetera, but require very little sleep. Sleep chip. Who wants this? 100%. I mean, to me, the big thing is if it's a button I press that I suddenly go to sleep and then it's yep. over with, that would be the best. I did like yesterday a million i will rob a bank for this I, thing brian you have sleep problems so literally just a go to sleep chip like forget it could take eight hours yeah as a matter of fact it could take 12 hours i could i could declare that starting now i sleep 12 hours a day but i never have that moment of trying to fall asleep yeah yep. yeah justin oh, I, would, I would take it yeah oh totally Bryce? Uh, uh, maybe I, I uh, what is that? I thought one of, again? Of you would, one of, <laughs> it's uh, a so chip, chip in your brain are, to where you don't. Yeah. Yeah. Five hour sleep equals 10 hours sleep. Um, hmm, I don't, uh, maybe, maybe, I don't know. I, 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 I would say, uh, I'm sorry, Bryce, uh, in this hypothetical uh, future dystopia, you cannot say maybe he's been outlawed. <laughs> That's right. As a matter of fact, uh, oh my God, the, mm. the the cyber units are on the way. They're uh -huh. driving their cyber trucks right now. You gotta, know. you better come up with a firm answer <laughs> I'm right get away. Get a steel ball and yeah. protect myself. <laughs> uh, Unless you've uh, got a bunch of steel ball bearings to right. throw at them, you're screwed. Uh, I would probably say no. I think I would probably say no, but I I don't have sleep Spoken problems. Spoken like someone yeah. in their twenties well, who not, sleeps well, they, soundly. They get into some app, Bryce, yeah. that Brian presses to go to sleep, which his family would not abuse at all. Don't worry. <laughs> um, and I just mean like if you if you when you naturally go to sleep, say no, this will enhance, but you won't feel. Then you'll you'll get twice the rest when you sleep. You know, and you'll get. I guess I, I guess that's it, it would depend on how invasive the surgery is because I mean that's 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 brain surgery and okay. I mean, you know, it's, I, it's, it's that's where I'm at. Yeah. I mean, uh, to, to be honest, uh, I think the thing that pleases me the most about this example is I've long theorized that if I could, I would love to live a 30 hour day instead of 24 hours because uh, I love being so exhausted that I just collapse and fall instantly to sleep. And once I do fall asleep, I love going as long as I possibly can. So I've long theorized that I would love to do a 20 hour work day and then a 10 hour sleep night and so this sounds right. as close to that as 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 i could get we're most of us are on board here's the next one um this is the workout chip this is very interesting what this does is it makes it when you work out you can work out to a higher intensity it minimizes the amount of pain or exhaustion you feel while you work out so you can spend 20 or 30 minutes working out maximizes helps your body regulate everything it needs to do that and actually can help trigger things like uh the growth hormones things like this naturally in your body but basically what it does is we looked at the brains of people who athletes and people who love to work out and love to do like crazy sessions and stuff and we figured out how to do this to your brain this one kind of exists uh and tell me if you agree with this or not it kind of exists already in the form of a trainer because we know that you could pay money and then by virtue of having somebody hold you accountable to show up, you show up more often, you work out harder because somebody's encouraging you person to person and, and you get more out of it. But I guess the idea of the chip would be uh, that, that, that it would be just instinctual and you would be able to do it on your own. Well, the trainer, I mean, everybody sort of responds differently and trainers work for many people for a period of time. And then after a period of time, the trainer becomes uh, less because also certain people have better predispositions towards working out there. There's some people who just have that, like, ah, I got that adrenaline rush and I loved it. And that runner's high and I've ran, I've done everything. I've never, never had that. I've never been like, ah, this feels great. I do it. Cause like I have to. Right. Yeah. I, I would take a pass on this one because I suspect that there will be others that will help me with fitness goals that don't necessarily have to do with the, you know, a, a chip that makes me want to be the rock, uh, working out at three 30 in the morning with gigantic chains around my neck. Uh, but 
I, 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 I suspect that I would be able. To, what I really want is increased focus, and so I will. I will take a pass on the specific workout one. I'd, okay. I'd, I'd consider this one. You know, I I went to the gym in my apartment this weekend, and I kind of didn't know I, I what I was. I had to look them online. What's the what what sets should I do? What should I do this to this? I I, I I could see that. Yeah, dude, I love right, the well, idea of Swole Bryce. I just want to picture <laughs> Swole Bryce wa- walking in, just just looking like the Rock, and just sits down. <laughs> There was a kid in my high school who was he was short, skinny guy, mm-hmm. and then he got kind of nice guy, but kind of like sort of the person nobody paid attention to. And then he got like serious hardcore working out, and maybe he used steroids. I don't know, but he he I watched that personality transformation where all of a sudden he became this much more confident guy. He didn't become a jerk. He became what was been interesting just watching that once his external shell sort of became this a little more noticeable and athletic and whatnot. I saw it was an amazing transformation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and keep in mind, there's little things that change. Like, like when your body becomes more muscular, you carry yourself differently. And as we know from various psychological studies, uh, there was one study that you had to bite a pencil, which inherently made your my- mouth smile. And then people reported general better senses of well-being compared to if you had to bite a pencil with it uh, lengthwise sticking out of your mouth, like a straw bite down that sort of inherently makes a frown. So it's like just the mere fact that you're forced to smile or forced to frown even if you don't know you're being forced to do those things seems to shape everything so i would imagine inherently being stronger and more powerful carrying yourself straight up uh just gives you a general sense of well-being where the little things don't 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 bite as hard want to know how i got these scars (laughs) (laughs) it was a study it was really weird um last chip all right okay you ready for this yep let's go you know you every now and then you don't want to, but you find yourself in a situation where like a uh, car accident or something or house on fire or somebody needs help or maybe you're being assaulted or attacked or whatever. This chip, what will do, it will elevate your adrenaline. It will increase your strength. Things that we could do, you know, basically flip, flip you into rock mode. So question, the first thing that I worry about is there's a number of times in my life that I have adrenaline rushes and they're not me being attacked. Like, are, are we correcting for false positives? Like, uh, just because you're nervous before a big speech or maybe you get bad news from the office, we're, we're assuming that the chip is able to distinguish between yeah, life-threatening you, you, situations? You, yeah, it's in a watch. You just press it on, like, all right, you know. There well, was... But- but also, it's like, like if you're getting nervous before a big presentation, then this chip might mean that you walk out and you are you are the rock, right? Like you are you 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 have that gravitas. Now all of a sudden, you are projecting by way of what you just uh, talked about the the posture, uh, uh, the fact that there is like so much oxygen coursing through uh, you as you kind of like harness it, but you don't feel you feel on top of it and not having it consume you. Well, let me let me do another thing. So, but a chip that let's say you, your body suffers some sort of trauma, it keeps you from going into shock, keeps you from you know bleeding out, does whatever it needs to do to keep you calm, so you increases your chances of survival. I mean that that seems like it should be put in every infant. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. that 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 seems if that there seems is like some, a safety belt. Yeah, that makes you just more durable as a, a thing. That seems like the kind of life saving. Uh, element that should probably be put into every single human that would be something we see because there are certain things that you're you know we're physiologically that you can do that increase your survival chances so something that auto regulates whatever so i mean yeah it, it, that that to me is the same thing as doing like mommy and me swim classes when when a yeah. baby is an infant just so they know how to you know not drown in a pool yeah that's I guess that's the thing, too, is there might be some very basic muscle muscle memory skills that might be implantable by chip, too. Shoot, I guess uh, now I can't think of a better segue to ever bring this up, but uh, keep an eye out on future Modern Road programming because talking about getting chips implanted Mm -hmm. in you, uh, one co-host of the Modern Road, Jason Murphy, got chipped by uh, by a friend of uh, Deviant Olive, who's a, a hacking legend, a penetration tester. He... 
has in him a, uh, a, 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 a subdermal chip implanted that is programmable by, get this, your iPhone. All you have to do is set it up to, to, to write on it. And so he, it was the weirdest thing. He got chipped. And then I was like, what are you going to put on? He's like, I don't know, whatever you want. And he was like, wait, you're going to let me program you? And he's like, yeah, sure. So I uploaded a thing so that now the human being, Jason Murphy, if you walk up and hold up an iPhone, the RFID chip triggers a link <laughs> that causes Mr. Roboto to play on, on YouTube. <laughs> and I asked him what he was going to swap it with. He goes, I don't know. That's pretty good. <laughs> so, so that's where he's at right now. <laughs> that's fun. All right, let's do some picks. Dude, hey, I, I got a pick. Oh, good. Hey, went to go see a movie on Friday. It's called Ford versus Ferrari, but it might as well be called Boy Stuff. Man, do you like boy stuff? Do you like cars? Man, is this car, this is the movie got cars. Uh, uh, not being good at your finances and disappointing your wife? Boy, does this movie have that too. Uh, uh, male friendships? Hell yeah. Europe? I mean, I guess that also counts. Uh, uh, look, it, it's it's a good movie. Uh, uh, I, don't, I can't speak to how much it is. Obviously, it's based on a true story. I am not a car historian, so I am not aware of where it uh, deviates from the uh, what, what really happened. I do know it's the first time that I've watched a movie with Christian Bale where he's playing the guy that was recorded on the set of Terminator Salvation threatening uh, to trash his lights. So, uh, <laughs> so, so, you, so it's a character uh, study in himself. <laughs> yeah, very, very short-tempered, thicker British accent than you might expect, uh, but undeniably good at his craft. The Christian Bale playing himself in Ford versus Ferrari. So the, the review on Ford versus Ferrari is, oh, good. Good yeah. for you. Good for you. <laughs> like, honestly, I would love to hear that those clips matched up against some of his scenes in Ford versus Ferrari because it is it is uncanny. Uh, and in all seriousness, it, it, it's a great uh, Matt Damon performance, great Christian Bale performance. Uh, and, uh, you know, spoiler alert. I, to be honest, I don't know why they called it Ford versus Ferrari because you know who's going to win because the movie's not in Italian. Yeah. So, uh, I saw a movie. I saw a couple of movies. I saw that Frozen 2. Uh, turns out there's exactly one scene worth watching in, in, in Frozen 2. Uh, and, uh, and we got to see it because I took the kids to go see it. And then I went to go see a movie later that night. And as we're walking by the theater, about to go up to the, the movie that I'm about to reveal, we see Frozen 2, and I'm looking at it. I'm like, oh, I think, hey, Bonnie, there's exactly one scene worth watching in Frozen 2. And so I was like, let's duck in. So we duck into the theater, happened to be right when that scene was happening. It was freaking great. <laughs> and then uh, and I was like, all right, you've seen everything you need to see from Frozen 2. And then off we go. But the movie we went and saw, sadly poorly attended, should be a full theater. Everybody should go see it. Favorite thing I've seen in a very long time, Jojo Rabbit was an absolute freaking joy there was not a second of that thing that i did not love it, it, i laughed so very very much about uh, during it uh i uh, cried at, at one point it was just it was just a delight i can't say go see it before i mean it, it'll be fine on the small screen but go see it if you can while it's still on the big screen mainly to cast your dollar vote so that uh, Disney, uh, this is one, uh, Bryce, am I right in understanding this? This was, uh, was it a Fox deal and then it got acquired and then Disney kind of soft released right. it because they're not big on, you know, Hitler youth movies with a fictitious Taika Waititi Hitler? Yeah, it's a Fox Searchlight uh, release. So it's one of their smaller uh, smaller brands. And yeah, my, my understanding is that some of the promotion, they kind of turn the knob down a little bit. There were questions of if they were going to release it, but it seems that they did. And even, even I seem to remember seeing on Taika Waititi's Twitter feed, even he soft sold it saying, Hey, I made a really quirky movie. Go see it. I guess if you want to go see something, that's how you would sell a movie. If you made really if you quirky made a movie, though, but, uh, <laughs> uh, it's, it, it, it comes on strong with sort of the transgressive nature of it taking place it, it's a flippant movie set in in you know Nazi Germany, 
And it, it's evocative of if you ever saw it to be or not to be with uh, Mel Brooks or likewise um, uh, the producers. It makes light of, of a dark time, but it also is very respectful of the very real consequences on it. Sam Rockwell is fantastic in it. The kid is amazing in it. Taika Waititi is an adorable uh, imaginary Hitler who uh, if you're not familiar with the conceit Hitler is his imaginary it's a 10 year old's imaginary friend and um, no Brian uh, Hitler was very real Scar <laughs> Scarlett Johansson <laughs> is the mom and uh, she's just heartbreakingly wonderful at trying to make the world a positive joyful place in the middle of a total crap show I loved Jojo Rabbit so, so much, and I'm hoping all of you guys will watch it so we can talk about it. Cool. You ever see Hunt for the Wilder People? Not yet. That's one I'm, 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 I'm saving it like a dessert. I know, that, I know it's going to be great. Is, if you, if you, especially if you, I mean, and I haven't seen Jojo Rabbit, but from what I can gather, uh, it is, it is a, a more fantastical uh, the exploration of some of the themes that were there in, uh, in in Hunt for the Wilder People, but Hunt for the Wilder People is bonkers good. Oh, it's I can't so wait! I can't that wait! Was, I, I, that I've was been like a YTD like... right before uh, where what we do in the shadows. Is that right? No, it came out after. Uh, oh, what after, we do in okay. the shadow was first, and then and then uh, Hunt for the Wilder People. So I've been I've been holding on to that one. Uh, Jojo Rabbit, just a heads up. Uh, go into it expecting to see somebody doing their best impression of Wes Anderson, like get over the fact that it's very Wes Anderson-y. That, mm. that, that it is Moonrise Kingdom with Hitler in Correct. The, the yeah, it's, it, youth. It, that's exactly what it is. It's Moonrise Kingdom mm. with Hitler. Uh, man, was it ever a joy. I I enjoyed it. Yeah, that was, I, I remember when, it, when, when, it, when, when some of the reviews came out and they're like, oh, this is Moonrise Kingdom with a fake Hitler. And I'm like, Really? <laughs> <laughs> You're like, what about this? Does that sound Why awesome? Did you put that on the poster, idiots. <laughs> that's that's how I was when Overwatch was announced. And everyone's like, this is just Team Fortress Two with upgraded graphics and better character design. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> Bryce? Uh, I got a pick. Uh, so over the weekend, I had some friends over, and we rewatched this movie. I don't know if I mentioned this on the show before, or maybe I, I might have been. This might have been a pick when I went and saw it in the theaters. But uh, we uh, watched The Art of Self Defense, which got uh, Jesse Eisenberg and uh, Imogen Poots in it. Uh, this is a really, really funny movie, and uh, watching watching it again, especially with people who had not seen it, and I had seen it. Um, uh, heightened sort of all of the very awkward uh, awkward humor of of the movie. Uh, it, it's about Jesse Eisenberg as a very milk toast sort of accountant who uh, gets uh, gets beat up in the street one day by a by a motorcycle gang and uh, uh, ends up taking a karate class to uh, you know to, to to be able to defend himself and uh, story, story, story stuff happens. It's 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 very good. I, it was only like ten dollars to buy it, the 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 digital version of the movie. So, uh, I I I I really recommend it, um, especially if you can cool. go in with not not knowing too much. Like maybe don't maybe don't see the trailer. I had I had someone who was who was watching it this weekend with us, uh, who <laughs> said a line <laughs> like of um, like ten seconds before the person on screen said the line, and I was like just let him say the thing. Anyway, um, uh, Art of Self-Defense, uh, I think it's very good. Jesse Eisenberg, Riley Steams. Can I give you guys a little bit of weird trivia? Just go back to the, the IMDb page you had for that. Sure. Okay, who's the actor on the right? That Not in Art of Self-Defense, the other movie. Oh, the random oh. article that is the kid from uh, A Christmas, Christmas Story? Story. Yep. What was the last movie you saw him in? I, I believe that was it. He, he was a one-and-done child actor, right? Final answer. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Spider Man Far From Home. Remember the guy that controlled Mysterio's computer simulations? No oh, kidding. Wow. Peter Billingsley. How fun. Oh my yeah. goodness. Yeah. He, he, uh, he, that they retconned him back into being yelled at, you know, in the Iron Man movie and all of that, you know? So. Oh, that's oh, great. Wow. Yeah. He was, he was big, big back in the day. And then, you know, he went away. But then I'm watching. I'm watching Far From Home again, and I'm like, hey, wait, that's that face. And I look it up. I'm like, oh, OMG, it's 
Peter Billingsley. I'll tell you what, man. Up. Hollywood is a is a crazy town. Um, they uh, I, 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 there was a production assistant on the TV show Hacking the System that we were doing, and uh, he was w- one of the hardest working. Just you know, put his head down, stoic, get the work done, reliable, wonderful, awesome, fun to hang out with, and like ne- one of the very last days, it comes up in conversation that he's the kid from the movie Fargo. And, uh, but meanwhile, super humble, super cool, just yeah. awesome, just working in the biz. It's, it's crazy. Wow. Yeah. All right, trivia question for you. <laughs> what do The Walking Dead, Black Panther, and uh, a media, media family funeral all have in common? Uh, it, it, none of my money. Wow. No, I don't know. Um, uh, they were all shot at in Atlanta. Yes, all shot in Atlanta at Tyler Perry Studios. I happened upon a video uh, the other day, which is a YouTube video of Tyler Perry for Architect, who's showing off to Architectural Digest the whole studio compound he has there, which is on a former military base. And it was a really interesting thing because Tyler Perry, he's like he, to me, he's like Seth MacFarlane. I love the guy. I'm not into the product. Right. Yeah. You know, like it, it's not for me, but I admire how creative and how, you know, how hardworking he has been. And it's really neat. You see this big, huge 300 acre studio compound they have with their own sets, with, you know, uh, versions of the White House, all the stuff. They have sound stages. They produce a lot of movies there, like you know, The Walking Dead shot there, you mentioned Black Panther, et cetera. And he's a guy that made his way into entertainment from outside. You know, he started as a playwright with a play that bombed and just worked at it and worked at it for a number of years and finally made it into a movie for $5 million that made $50 million. And then he realized, like, hey, there's an audience out there that's being underserved. Let me create content for him. And he built up his own media empire. You know, he owns all of his movies outright. Lionsgate distributes them. He produces, like, half a dozen TV shows, et cetera. So I just was watching this. It was neat. It was neat to see somebody who just made it from outside the system and by his own rules. You know? and, uh, for, and for the way, record... Not, not- no, uh, I, I was uh, just gonna say, like, for for for, for the record, uh, 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 God bless him. Good luck. If you ask me, that's two hundred ninety three too many acres. I mean, it's, you don't want to have that many acres. True. Just, uh, he's compensating, compensating, Brian. He's compensating. Yeah. Uh, uh, not just uh, movies and television shows. The last uh, Democratic presidential debate for last week from Tyler. No Paris kidding. Too. Wow. Yep. Usually you would think that would be at like a school or like university or something, yeah. but yeah, no, they, they set up the, the entire set staging, uh, you know, aired on MSNBC uh, wow. from Tyler Perry studios. And I believe it's not only just a former military base. I think it was initially a former Confederate, uh, military base, which is part of the, the story <laughs> from Tyler Perry's perspective that now he built the first black owned, uh, massive studio on better <laughs> military base. Say so Robert E. Lee talking to like a, a psychic. He's like, "Let's look into the ball. I'm going to show you the future of what's yeah. going to happen here." Th- yeah, there is it, something it, all of a sudden, uh, like the, the psychic's like, uh, "Hello, hello." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. Anyhow, um, worth checking out because again. Uh, I love stories like that. I love stories of people who just, you know, probably were treated as outsiders, felt like outsiders. And when he went through a lot as a young man, I mean, just as a kid, whatever, and to to be where he is, whatever, I think is, I think we can all take some inspiration from. On that note, it's been weird. Mm. Hey. Mm. The then it's neat watch that video though because like you see they like the production offices but then they have floors where like one wing of it looks like a hospital there's a bar there's all this other stuff they have a they have a big mansion that has four sides to it cool. so if they want to shoot like a different facade or a different front they just move their camera equipment 100 feet wow that's clever yeah really really very very smart sort of thinking about all this very cool yeah. we'll, that's uh... great We'll definitely have it uh, in the show notes, as usual. Well, um, I'll pop it in the chat here, too. Uh, very cool. All right. Uh, let's uh, take a short break. Yeah, there might be a things. video that we're about to post. Let me let me check in on that real quick. I'll oh, be right back. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hey, good weird things, everybody. Ugh, get your stretches in. Oh, yeah. Hmm. You guys keeping up with uh, uh, 
Rick and Morty? I, I'm actually too behind. Really? Um, oh. Yeah, you want to know what? I don't really have a great place to watch them. I don't know where mm. they show up. Do they yeah. show up on Hulu? No, they don't. Like, no, because I, I, I have to watch it through Brian's PlayStation View DVR. I think if you... I think if you have a cable authentication, you could use the Adult Swim I know app. They're basically for free on the like Adult Swim website. You can just watch them. <laughs> the I website. I just buy it. I'm like it's Rick and Morty. I'm like it's Rick and Morty. I'm first. I'm like ah, I don't want to pay. I'm like oh, it's Rick and Morty. Like I'm gonna watch each one a billion times. You wanna know what? That is that is a good point. I should just get the season pass on on iTunes. Because I was the first like oh, how many, is it gonna be a half season? Is I'm like do I care? Right. Like if yeah. if you know I'll go to I'll go extra and order Bloom and Onion and won't eat it at Outback and I'm gonna sit here going like well, I don't Mike this Rick and Morty do I want to spend this this money for this yes yes I do mm -mm. yeah yeah, yeah but, and and they are doing a I, I don't think it's a half season I think they just started it it's still just gonna be ten episodes but it won't they're only gonna have five out before the end of the year. So like it's a it, like weird holiday hiatus stuff. Oh. Like there there's yeah no, I I there's there's yeah, not a new I, episode next week for example just because scheduling stuff is weird. Last night's episode I loved it was I, and, it, and it's yeah it's 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 you know Dan Har Dan Harmon ranting about something he hates which something I think that there's a lot more can be a lot more nuance to it than he acknowledges mm -hmm. but I still love the fact to watch him rant on the thing you know it's yeah. it's, it's yeah, when Rain Har Dan Harmon talks story structure, I think, ah, this is kind of nice. I see how you look at it through a very small lens, and you know, Ooh. you still haven't found the protagonist in Back to the Future. That's fine, um, but <laughs> I think he's amazing. Like, I'm we're watching Community right now, and like, I, I watched... really want to rewatch that. What's that? I really want to rewatch that because someone. Yeah, like first, yeah. first few first few episodes were really off. I was really kind of like, I'll stick with it. By the end of the mm. first season. Really dug it. And second season and stuff, I'm like, oh, this is a wonderfully, like they call it, like, this is a bottle show. You know, Abed, you know, calling the things as they are is great. But then the way they do it and the delivery stuff, like I watched the Dungeons and Dragons episode. I'm like, this had minimal locations. This was wonderfully done. And, you know, really, really good use of the environments and stuff and whatnot. And so I'm a fan. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I watched... So I, I didn't finish watching it. I might do. I might just skip to the last episode because probably don't need it. But uh, they got a they got this new Netflix. I think I think they called it a limited series. I think they did. Um, called the Island. Oh, I heard horrible. I heard that's like. Oh no! Horrible. This is like your new favorite hate watch. It's yeah. it's awful. Well, it was so I watched I watched the th I watched three maybe three and a half episodes hate watching it. And so I don't, I don't even know how much to say. Cause like the trailer kind of like hints that there's a thing going on in this, in the I'm show. I'm not going to watch it. So, so oh, anybody here, anybody here? Yeah. Anybody anybody here? Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, like how many people, like a dozen people or so wake up on an Island and they're definitely just doing loss. They're definitely just being like, Oh, we, we don't, we don't even remember our names. And so they, they find that, <laughs> On their shirts, they have names on their tags, um, and and they're like, "Oh, we were all evenly spaced apart from each other, and it was all thirty nine steps away from each other." And so it's like thirty nine. Oh, there's thirty nine here. There's thirty nine here, and uh, what and then and then for for some reason, uh, the the main character that we follow, she gets beat up. And then she wakes up in this futuristic hospital, and they find out that it's a it's prison, it's a virtual reality prison. Um, and then and then they send her back, and then they send her back, and then two like prison guards, like quote unquote new people on the island, show up, and they're just like, yeah, no, she's right. Like this all seems like a real island to you people, but this is definitely just prison, and we're prison guards. And so here's like four more episodes of you solving your various crimes out. It's the, it's so. <laughs> it's 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 insane like literally i'm not kidding when i say this they are like yeah no you got it you figured out the premise of the thing that we're doing so uh <laughs> see you in the finale good yeah. <laughs> yeah they've had really like some of the late the sci-fi series stuff they've offered have been, been like mm -hmm. that netflix brand don't mean what it used to
to me. Certainly not for. Uh, it's so weird that they are like so hot and cold on sci-fi stuff. I know Mother. I know a lot of people like Mother. Uh, Mother was okay. Mother was had a very expensive CG budget, I think. But wait, Mother was a show, not just the. No, it was a movie. movie. It was a movie. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But it was it was sci-fi. I guess I'm just talking about Netflix making sci-fi stuff. They didn't do Mother, did they? Not um not mother exclamation point uh I think there's another mother oh, maybe it's uh, is it I am mother uh, uh, yeah sorry it's called, it's I am mother it's a it's um no not not the uh um the Aronofsky uh, mother yeah no not the Aronofsky one the one with um uh the robot uh the robot mother raising a girl in the post apocalypse oh uh, okay yeah. yeah. Yeah, but then they did that one. What was the one with the uh, Jonah? Who's super bad, dude? Jonah Hill. Jonah Hill and uh, Emma. Oh, um, whatever. Maniac. Maniac was very good. Maniac. But Maniac, Maniac is Maniac yeah. is like not sci. It's kind of soft sci-fi, but it's also very like twee. Um. Like, I don't know. I mean, it certainly spanned a lot of genres. Like, I mean, it was yeah. in a in a near future world. Like, uh, it was it was urban fantasy or urban cyber fantasy, maybe the best word. Yeah, yeah. Maniac was good. Uh, Maniac was very good. Um, I dug Maniac. Yeah. yeah. We're not talking about you, Andrew. We're talking about uh the, the Netflix. The, Series, Maniac. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the, I wanted to see the original, the the Scandinavian one. Right. I liked it, and then I didn't like it. Yeah, I, I heard. I, yeah, I've heard. I've heard good things about the original. Yeah, I just I wished it bought into its world a little bit more, but mm. enjoyed it though. Yeah. Um. All righty, uh, Justin, did you need to go take a break real quick for? Uh, I'm good. Yeah, you good. You guys want to do after things? Ready. Did we get any uh, after things stuff? Because I have a topic which I think we could talk about. Uh, we have not. Just how the so. hell? What's that? We no. We did not get. So a lot. we could talk about how the hell Justin's going to promote his podcast. Yeah, let's make it all about <laughs> Justin's thing. Yeah. Okay. All right, then let's start after things here in three, two. Hello and welcome to the After Things podcast. I'm Andrew Maine, joined by Justin Robert Young. Hi. Brian Brushwood. Hello, beautiful people. Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hey, everybody. That's me. So, uh, Justin. Justin's mm -hmm. about to venture out into the world of uh, podca podcasting. This thing called podcast. Have you heard about this, Brian? Podcasting? <laughs> I, I think it's going to be huge. No, no, no. This, this is actually a wonderful example of uh, a real life case study in the moment as we're getting ready to launch. Justin's got a plan and yeah. uh, everything we're about to discuss. Uh, keep in mind one thing, and maybe I think we'll all agree on this. Uh, regardless of how all of this turned out, the smartest thing Justin has done has been soliciting the advice of everybody around him. Like the, the, everybody is a treasure trove, whether you agree or disagree with whatever it is they're, they're into um, <clears throat> or, or whatever their philosophies are. I think, Justin, would you agree that at this point, pre-launch, you would say that, 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 that it's been a net positive to, to get the advice of as many people as you can? A hundred percent. It's funny. Bryce just pulled up a tweet that I had over the weekend that editing my own audio has maybe I, I find myself coming back to a Kanye West tweet from when he did uh, the Life of Pablo album where one of the songs is called Wolves. And uh, he just three days after it was out was just like uh, just tweeted out. I'm a fix wolves. <laughs> <laughs> so it was one of those things that I just thought so much about where it's like, it, it's a way for me to like, it almost, it makes me feel comfortable because I'm like, even Kanye West, somebody who's at the top of, of the music world is like releasing an album. And it's like, ah, I don't like that part. And now we're in a digital world where it's not just one thing that goes to press. And then all of a sudden it's on CDs and, the, the boat has kind of left the harbor culturally, you can go back and change it. So push comes to shove. There's a lot of things that I could, I could fix. That being said, yes, throughout the process, uh, the, 
I mean, I if there's one thing that I have always felt kind of gifted in, it is that uh, I'm surrounded by tremendously high-functioning and ambitious people, uh, people that I've learned uh, all the important lessons of my life uh, uh, directly through, and I would certainly count the two men uh, who we started this podcast with uh, uh, among them. I would, uh, I would certainly, I've learned a lot from uh, the stuff that Bryce has has done in terms of being a music artist and and creating stuff on a, a deadline within a system uh, like you guys do now at uh, you know Modern Rogue and Scam Nation. So uh, this process, I've relied a lot, and and there really is um, there's uh, an art to doing it because uh, you know this this project that I have is I think seven and a half to eight hours when you listen to everything that's a lot right you know that's that's a substantial audiobook that's a entire podcast series as this will be and so it's hard you know it's it, you have to be careful about how much you are feeding to the people that you need to uh get opinions from because uh you know you you almost even as somebody for whom you that you are soliciting opinions from you got to make sure that they are listening to it and they understand it and they can give you that that feedback uh uh in the same way that a listener would give judgment once they hear it that's such a critical thing because i know with with the books when i started writing books is i know i could go to you for feedback justin because we have similar tastes in a lot of things and and it was a very very instrumental and you know, I had friends that would some friends who wanted to offer advice, but I'm like, they don't read one. Many of them didn't read. They didn't read the genre, and and it was you know even separate in the fact from people understanding how to help you versus them try to get their own ideas across, and that was a big thing was learning. I go to this person for this advice because I know they really understand this, and I go to this person for this advice and this person for that, and understanding. Your brain trust has different parts to it. You know, your brain trust, there's different parts of the brain and the same thing when you put together your brain trust is to know what you want from them. And and specifically for me, you know, I knew, you know, when I sent you, Andrew, the first stuff, I knew that I was going to get different feedback than Brian was going to give me. And I know that the stuff that Brian was going to give me, you know, there was a point in which I sent the first like beta, beta, betas to everybody. And... Uh, you know, Andrew, uh, you gave me uh, awesome feedback that uh, very much affected where the project went. One of the biggest things that you had was, uh, you know, just separating in terms of theme. That it's like uh, the first version of the first episode had an introduction to all of my characters. And uh, Andrew, I remember, said to me, like, you know, like, I, I know, you know, depending on where you want to put stuff, but like, there's a lot of stuff about Nixon that is very different from the story about Kennedy. And it would probably benefit from having that separate. Uh, and it that wound up being something that stuck with me throughout the process that eventually made me rewrite and reorganize the series so I could give that story its own kind of space to breathe. For Brian, on the other hand, uh, Brian, I would, I would uh, uh, explain Brian's reaction to the beta episode as like, a, a transplant that was rejected by the host body. <laughs> like there was, there was an element of Brian that I know was, that would be like, Hey, look, if you want to go forward with this, understand that here's what's good. Here's what, you know, I think that the, the, the trajectory would be, but there kind of needs to be this fundamental retooling. I knew if I wanted to get the most out of the Brian feedback, because the Brian feedback he is among the, one of the most gifted people that I know uh, in terms of predicting a final audience's reaction, uh, of both from a craftsman's perspective on polish and also on a gut level, like here's where the 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 psychology of the listener will be from the moment that they first see it to the moment that they first try it to the moment that that you want to get them to by the very end. I don't know if there's really anybody else in my life that I know that that can articulate it like that. And that's why it's like, I knew when the first one was like, ah, like there's a lot here, we can go through it. And and we did, but I'm like, nah, you, that's not 
the best version of the Brian feedback. The best version of the Brian feedback is I got to bring it far closer to a finished product. And then at the point that we did that, well, and, and, and to, to an your amazing. credit, the whole, the whole reason that you, uh, initiated program, you know, Brian full polish subroutine or whatever, uh, is because you very clearly articulated your goals for this project. You made it very clear that this was not, if you had told me that it's like, man, I really think my fans are going to enjoy this. And I'm like, yes, they definitely will. It's fine as is go ahead. But, but, in a million different little ways you had, you had programmed me with the expectation of like, I feel like this could be a breakout hit, something that is easily palatable by people who have never even seen night attack. Don't even know who I am. It stands on its own or whatever. And that, uh, that subroutine is, is very, very different. There are different uh, expectations for it. Um, that, uh, that I, I feel like, to be honest, if, if, if there's anything interesting about that moment, it's your insistence that you very clearly set your expectations. And you asked me very sincerely, what parts of this production are incongruent with the expectations yeah. that I'm trying to lay out for it? You know, and it's interesting too, because like, if you think about like what Brian does on a daily basis and what I do on a daily basis, where Brian Brian's creating content, getting feedback, creating content, getting feedback. And that's every single day from everything you do from the fi the feeds here to the YouTube stuff. So you're, you're very finely attuned to like, you know, if you do this, this is going to happen here, whatever, you know? And like, for me, like I work very far away from like, you know, my, my feedback is I just go check, you know, the overall Amazon rating and I look at the sales of a book. But other than that, you know, my day is if I'm working on a writing project, it's like, how do I organ? How do I t how do I find the theme? How do I find you know my 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 chapter? How do I find the structure? How do I find this sort of thing? And I'm just at that end. And as far as like where it lands with the audiences and stuff, God, I have no I have no idea. All I know is if I if I follow my little checklist, people tend to like it. But other than that, no clue. That's actually a really good way to put it because it's like um, uh, I I often describe uh, all media creation as some form of spellcraft where it's like, I don't know why it works, but I know if you say these things and do these moves and cause this thing, this result happens. And it's very hard to want to stray very far from that. And especially if, from a business perspective, we're recording this uh, on the Monday before Black Friday. Uh, Black Friday is a big enough day. Everybody's buying their gifts uh, or, or a big enough week now, I guess, or month. But uh, all of a sudden, there was a number of moves that we had intended to make that now that we're up against it, it's like, all I know is that the spell works when we did this thing before. And so let's say we scale back some of these changes and just make, you know, mild tweaks. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry, Justin, go ahead. No, no, no. Yeah, I, I was just, it, pff, nothing clarifies life like a deadline, man. Like yep. That is, that is uh holy crap. Like, you know, I have, you know, looking at this big board that I have a light specifically trained on just so all I can do is see days until the launch daily stuff that I have to do because uh, I have a date that it has to be done by and I got to start promoting it. And, well, I gotta... and, and there was definitely that moment uh, we were chatting. Was it yesterday or the day before um, uh, we were chatting by text about, the album art and there was sort of yeah. back uh, a back and forth discussion uh that really boiled down to there was some perfect version of the thumbnail that was bold and would land perfectly for both justin and for me uh and and uh, but but then there's what we could ship now and and being up against deadline makes you evaluate like what's truly important whether or not your thumbnail you know, tells this, this, this esoteric, crazy journey well, of a story or, or whether or not it communicates, that's what this thing is. And th that's, and that's the thing is part of what I wanted to do here. And this went through a bunch of different versions of like, all right, what is this for? What am I doing this for? Part of it is to prove that I can. Part of it is to prove that I can do something that is beyond live to tape podcasting, that I can get better at it. And that, uh, then I found when I tried to bring on a professional editor uh, that I didn't even know where to start with her. Like I had no clue what to ask of her. She was walking me through everything and it became very clear that if I was going to bring her on, 
I was hiring a chef, not a nutritionist. And what I needed was a full nutrition pro. I, I needed to know what vitamins were. I needed to know what saturated fats were. And for her, she's just like, all right, you just give me the stuff and I'll prepare it for you. But that's pretty much the, 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 the best part of her artisanship. And so I realized I had to do it myself. I had to make sure that I knew the very basics of the storytelling, the very basics of the construction, the very basics of, of, of the publishing of it. So then I can go forward, but on a monetary level, initially I was thinking about a Kickstarter, uh, a, to just kind of get the word out and to rally the base. Uh, and then eventually when I decided to do it by myself, I'm like, I don't, I, I feel like that would feel kind of dirty for me to be like, Hey, pay me to make this thing that I really want to do. Uh, I would much rather get everybody's buy-in on eBooks and audiobooks because from my perspective, especially if what I want out of this is increased notoriety in the political space, there is, and this is something that I remember Andrew uh, uh, telling me, like, you know, there's in politics, really it's like writing. Writing is what matters. Writing a blog, writing a book. If you have one of those things, and specifically books, uh, now all of a sudden you are just kind of looked at on a different level as opposed to just being a person with a Twitter account, uh, although that can make you pretty popular. And so with the launch next week, you know, it's going to come with an ebook and an audiobook. And initially I was like, all right, well, I'll rewrite all the transcripts. And so this will read much more like a traditional book. And then at a certain point, I started looking at the schedule. And I'm like, oh, a compilation of transcripts sounds uh, sounds sounds a lot better to me right now. And you want to know what? If I have a compilation of transcripts uh, and people like it well enough and people are just buying it to support it or just buying it because they want to have an opportunity to pour through the things that I'm saying when, in a little bit more uh, of focus, then I can always write another book. I can always take all that information and I can always add on to it and I can always make it another narrative on top of this. The point of this right now is that a week from today, we've got a really awesome podcast ranking. We've got a really awesome Amazon ranking. We've got a really awesome uh, uh, Audible ranking. And that's the success. The, the, the success of all this is trying to get to that point. And there, there is a temptation to believe that you only get one launch. And that, that is true to a point. I mean, you want it to be as complete as you're able to in that moment. But in a world where we're, a com where we're comfortable with a re-release as a gold edition or a platinum edition or a gold platinum turbo plutonium edition or whatever, like uh, you sort of get multiple at-bats and that instinct that kept you from making it a Kickstarter you you mentioned that it made you feel dirty. I don't think it's a matter of feeling dirty so much as having a strong sense that you only get to press certain buttons so many times. And yeah. you felt like pressing that button was not necessary. And to be honest, I, I did the same thing when it came time. You know, we hit 90% funding on getting the studio space functional and we just needed a boost on that last 10%. We did all of that behind the paywall specifically because I didn't want to do the whole, this is our target number. These are our numbers. This is your perceived ownership in the country and in the company and so on. Instead, we reduced it all to a very simple narrative of, have you enjoyed this so far? Do you have some money that you don't mind throwing my way that you feel like, uh, I've already earned. Uh, would you like some rewards uh, that 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 don't cost us very much to make, but but will enhance your prestige? Uh, and uh, uh, it was a weird moment to decide. I, I don't want to make any of our numbers public. I just want to say uh, we only expressed it in terms of percentages. Like there's a number. We have to get from point A to point B. We're 30% of the way there, 40%, 50%. Hey, we made it. And then after we made it, people still kept showing up saying, hey, can, can, can I join in? And so likewise, I feel like you did yourself a very powerful service by not playing the Kickstarter game because that's yeah. sort of that's sort of a one-off adventure. Once you slay that dragon, you don't get to act like it comes back from the dead. Instead, you know what you're doing is you're taking all that goodwill that you've built up, the 
real estate that you have in the minds of tens of thousands of people and say, hey, this is the current project. If it's fun for you to, in terms of harvesting their efforts, their actual attention to click and subscribe on multiple platforms or whatever, if it's fun for you to proselytize, to go out to Reddit and talk about and share and, and say, hey, I'm an early investor in this indie band, basically, uh, or and if it's fun for you to give money directly to buy the, the, the book on Audible, then hopefully, you know, me, Justin Robert Young, has earned enough respect that, 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 that none of this feels like a, a big ask for any of you. Yeah, and everything comes with value immediately, which is, I think, the biggest thing. Uh, uh, is, is that it's like, boom, support me. You're going to feel great supporting me. Uh, it's probably going to be a grand total of like five to eight dollars if you buy both the audiobook and the ebook. Uh, and then at, at that point, like, uh, you're going to feel good and you're going to have two things and you're going to be able to enjoy it the way you want. I, I think. What I what I want is I like is that you're you you understanding that you have time to promote it as Brian pointed out and the thing that publishers don't realize is how much the world has changed because when your your main sources of income are an audio book uh, a podcast uh, an ebook is that those you can produce infinitely you don't need a warehouse to have those things for and so you can do a slow ramp up to there you can try initially bring attention to it and then get this sort of the, the kind of the, the two humped camel where you get your little push initially and then it starts to slow and build, 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 build. And then you see a bigger spike later on as it starts to reach critical mass and publishing companies don't think like that. A lot of people do releases. Don't think about it. They think I've got to do it all now. And if I don't, then it's all over. Well, and keep, keep, keep in mind, publishing companies deal with an awful lot of people where they're only going to write one book. They can't rely on the idea that people are story factories, then they're going to be the next James Patterson, well, it, and Stephen King, or whatever. It's not even that. It's it's the uh, publishing company because of the way tax laws work. They basically have like they they destroy their inventory after like six months or whatever because that's the way they can they can realize the the loss and not and have it towards a tax benefit. So they don't like to keep books. They won't even even a book that could be a one book could be a slow burner and eventually sell a lot over a year. It's why. Best sellers bit lists are based upon what are sold in a week and not a year. You don't hear what the year's best seller is because publishers don't care. They're not incentivized towards it to their own detriment, which is why ebooks are taking such a big impact from that. And that's that's a big problem because you might have a book that's a slow burner that takes a long time to sort of reach popularity. But if the publisher stops publishing it, they lose out on that. And now there are a lot of ebook publishers and people like myself were like, no, like you can have something that just takes you know, like my Angel Killer book, if that had been a traditionally released book by a publisher, would have just flopped, never done anything. I did it, and it took, from the time I released it to finally when it hit was six months, seven months, and then it sold hundreds of thousands of copies. Yeah, and, well, and, and that, I, that's no just in the ebook that, version publishing. before it got picked up <laughs> I, by a publisher, right? What's that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I will, I will never forget uh, at being at at the Pulse Loft at Dragon Con. Uh, with Andrew and Andrew, who is uh, a, a very uh, uh, engaged person when we're hanging out, just not being able to stop look at his phone to just see like the the it, it, it insanely escalating numbers on Angel Killer. And that was something where it just like it was well reviewed enough. It was good enough. And it caught the right tailwinds. And, you know, that was it. it. That was Never it hit back. that long. I released it like in March. And I, yeah. I, to my own audience, and it got a really good response, and then it slowed down, and I'd moved on to my next book, Hollywood Pharaohs, was the middle of promoting this, but the algorithms, the word of mouth had built up behind my back, and the next thing you know, and, and that's the thing that, like, I, I, I think that's, for other people out there creating stuff, is know that, like, if it's out there and you're, you never know. Man, you know? May, maybe that's sort of the theme that we're circling in on on this episode is that you get multiple bites at the apple like we're now entering a phase with scam nation where it's been so long that there's no reasonable expectation that anybody watching today was there 11 years ago when scam school first launched and we can finally start revisiting all those and refreshing them with with updated formatting with updated uh, quality of, of, of shooting uh, with, with a character that matches the type of stories that we're telling right now. 
like there's a temptation to believe like you only get your one at bat, but that's just not true. You get to go back and keep on revisiting and relaunching in various iterations, everything. And that's a very mm -hmm. YouTube idea of not putting the same thing out multiple times. Once you right, correct. And and we're we're starting to dip a toe right now in the the Twitter world as we start to monetize Twitter videos or whatever. Like one of the things I want to do next is do a whole tweet thread where we go back and revisit um, over the last 10 years. I think we've done what eight uh, of our family Christmas card videos. And it's around mm -hmm. that time of year that I just want to take people on a journey starting in, I, I think 2010 all the way up through 2017. Uh, and, and, then, and then sort of build up excitement for what our next family Christmas card will be because those numbers are, are starting to get pretty good there as well. And, and you see it in podcasting too, right? I, like the, and the NPR stuff, I know some of their shows, they'll rerun old episodes because they're evergreen, mostly interviews, right? And so, and it, and it doesn't so take much to refresh it. Usually it's a up to the minute, uh, like a, a recent reintroduction, like, hey guys, uh, we're here. It's this time, it's this place. You know me from these things. Uh, we're going to go back and revisit this, and we'll have a little thing at the end of an update of what happened. And then, and, and, and mm -hmm. as a consumer, I'm totally fine with all of that. So it's like, uh, as, as much as, and I'm sure Justin's already processed all of this, but as, much as it would feel like this is a do or die, must get it right moment, there's also kind of, we've seen precedents of ways to, to, to go back and enhance that release after the fact. Yeah, I mean, the, the, this is not a do or die moment for me. I mean, the biggest thing is uh, I just need to get the uh, the ebook into into a place where it's sellable. I need to get the audio book in a place that it's sellable. Uh, I'm, I know the ebook, you can, you can push revisions uh, I'm not sure about the audio book, but uh, the other than that, you know, look tomorrow on the on the PX3 feed, I'm going to put a version of the first episode. And so that's going to be designed to get everybody who are like inside the basically my hardcores. Let's get the hardcores pumped. Right. Uh, and then in a week's time we release the the main feed uh, that will have a little bit extra in that first episode that'll go out on the PX3 feed. Uh, and that the only thing that is like, you only really get the first bite of the apple on is in terms of podcast charts, like that's almost 150% uh, new subscribers. So you really only get one one chance to eat a Reese's when it, when it comes to uh, like, if we're going to get to number one or number five, a couple of questions in terms of sort of a launch street team. The temptation is to believe that you put your thing out and then your fans spontaneously rally around you. Now we're a little bit spoiled in diamond club and that we have a bunch of very passionate, self-starting, very internet savvy fans. But uh, have you, uh, thought about how to, um, if not directly indicate what people should be doing, at least indicate where the hotspots are, or is there a Discord server? I guess the Diamond Club Discord server would be the best place to sort of coordinate a street team. But it's like, um, uh, when you do, and I don't know if you've planned to do this, like an AMA on slash R slash politics or whatever, that early momentum, those early upvotes matter an awful lot when it comes to building yeah. up a, a whole discussion about a thing. Um, uh, have you, have you started to put, and I know, I know you're down to the wire and just getting the thing published, but, but what's your, what's your game plan and what are your priorities in that game? So the, the, the biggest thing that I have known from the very beginning, and I do believe based on some of the research in terms of what numbers need to move to get to the higher echelon of the iTunes podcasting chart, I believe that within our own community, if I turn out a significant portion of that, uh, then, then we can do it, right? But our community also includes Daily Tech News Show and The Morning Stream, uh, this podcast, Night Attack. Like, there's, there's a reason why I'm launching it on a Tuesday, for example, <laughs> uh, because I know that the, in, in the 24-hour period, it's going to be very, very, very crucial to push everybody to subscribe to the feed that day. You know, uh, that's that's pretty much uh, pretty much it. And then 
you know, once we get to wherever we peak at, that's the take a picture, remember that one forever kind of moment uh, that then gives our community a little something to show for it, right? Because everybody loves blowing up the Death Star. Nobody forgets the moment when that happens. Uh, and then at that point, it's all proselytization. Uh, prost proselytization? Can pros I say that? Pros proselytize. Pros Promoting. Uh, Promoting. Yeah. Uh, promoting it's all basically you know because at that point it's only the first episode is going to be out right uh and uh so i feel very confident in that first episode i think that first episode's very good uh so that is something that i'm happy about uh, i will feel confident going to war and then at that point it's just each successive episode uh get the stuff get the word out there and the reason why i'm releasing it now is because and this is a you know we'll find out whether or not this is stupid uh, two reasons. Number one, every time that I've fallen in love with one of these kinds of series, these limited run series, has always been over the holidays because I've got a lot of travel and shows take episodes off. And so all of a sudden you find yourself with time in your schedule that you look at your feed and you can't find stuff. And so what I want is for the buzz about this to hit while that's happening. And then the other consideration was, well, I mean, do I release it in January? Do I release it when all anybody's going to be doing is talking about politics? Uh, and I ultimately decided to do it a little bit earlier, just so a, the whole show will be out by January and people can binge it. You know, I, I would rather have a good word of mouth, great star rating, uh, uh, good momentum on the charts, and then uh, we will see kind of where it goes from there. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I think now is better. And we start off talking to about the in how much a deadline helps clarify things. And like I see that with my girlfriend when we get ready to like send a film off to what's called the DCP, which is like the digital version they send out to festivals and stuff. And when we're like, now's the chance to make the final edits. Now's the chance to do this. And then all of a sudden everything zeroes in and focus and everything you realize what's important and what's not. Oh. Yeah. Excited. So, uh, sir, let us know what we can do. Um, I will promote it on my email list, you know, my Twitter, whatever. If you want to do a periscope with me where we talk about it, let me know. And Absolutely. you know, I, 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 I'm excited. I don't, you know, I don't, I barely use my email list to promote my own stuff, but you know, I think <laughs> it'll be fun to promote something you do. And you know, yeah, yeah. I had somebody, what's that? Uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I had somebody emailed me, and I give them credit for it. Like, they go, oh, can I use your email list now? And then I'm building one. I'll let you use mine in the future. And I'm like, well, I've been building this for a long time, and it's sort of I only use it sparingly and whatnot. And they're like, yeah, but can I use it? And I'm like, how do I politely say I don't know you, and that's that's like, you know. <laughs> Well, and, and uh, 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 what you want to do in that case is what Peter Bogosian calls uh, uh, build a golden bridge where it's like your ask is to full on dedicate your, you know, pledge your, your, your banner to, to my journey. But then what you want to do is have kind of a golden bridge where it makes it easy for them to meet you halfway where it's like, Hey, what if I did a special discount for your team or whatever, something where you could say, Hey, I like independent creators in general. I like this guy in general. If you like independent creators who do work that sounds like this guy's work, here's a thing you could do, some way to meet it in the middle. That would have made it easier, but it sounds like they, they went for but the goal to send a out a early. specific email just to do that for like, I mean, that's like, I use my email like once every three months. You know, so to me, that's got it. So, so in that I, case, he doesn't realize the the hidden currency of like I don't even do it every week for me. Yeah, and so yeah. that would be very out of well, character. Just, yeah, there's there's a lot of stuff I like I promote, but I don't. And so I it was sort of like because it's a big email. It was like like this is like if I was, you know, if I was to put a dollar amount on this, it's a lot, I and mean, I wouldn't. But you know, that was sort of the thing I was trying. And then they're like, oh, and I'll give you my book to read. I'm like. That's uh, not a favor, <laughs> you yeah. know. So, but I was because I gave him helpful advice. Hey, here's some ways to build your list. Blah 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 blah. I'm like, yeah, but can I use yours? And I'm like, uh, <laughs> well, and and, and again, so so uh, uh, this will end up being a whole episode down the road. But I I've been 
working out the ideas on this whole story attention sales circle. And the temptation is always to go backwards. Uh, the circle can only go clockwise. We'll explain all this in a future episode uh, uh, because I'm pretty sure I'm going to end up writing a book on it. But the temptation is this guy is strong in story. What he lacks is attention and what he wants is sales. So he's asking you to pretty please leapfrog him and go backwards. But the problem is what he should do is he, he's got to build his own audience. He's got to justify his own thing, or he needs to partner with somebody where he's doing you a service. For example, there are people who have mailing lists where the service that they offer is nothing but, I found another curious, awesome item, do this. And so in that case, this is somebody who is hungry for story and you're showing up and we're like, hey, I have a story for you. You know, blogs are this way where it's like they wake up every morning, they're like, ah, crap, we gotta go find story. So when somebody shows up saying, hey, I have a story for you, it'll make it easier for you to feed your attention uh, folks, and I'll end up getting sales. But at any rate, uh, it just sounds like uh, when somebody's strong in story, oftentimes what they want is to go straight to money, uh, to sales, and sales is either money or clicks or signing up I for things or whatever. I don't know if book is done yet either. That's oh, the other right. thing, too. It's not done. like, it's not like, it, it's, if we had, if we had, like, if it was a listener to the show or somebody, we'd, we'd be going through or whatever, like, you know, if, like, like JF Dubo, hey, if you're listening, if you ever ask, it's yours. You, you've you've been great, loyal. You know, you know, you're you're super supportive and whatnot. He's a guy like, yeah, I'll do whatever I can for. And there's some people like there's some you know in in the family sort of people, some listeners and stuff, happy to do that for. This was just sort of a kind of a more rando thing. And and I think back, my first mailing list was a physical mailing list. I got to promote my magic book that Rand Woodbury gave to me. I had to get that. I got that after. I literally fed his mountain lion for a summer. <laughs> you know, well, so, and, and you again, know. like that's I, a thing of value hand. and you paid for it. Now, granted, it wasn't in, in the currency of money. It was in a different type of currency, but likewise, uh, you know, you know that, yes, you have, you have to earn a certain thing. And in this case, uh, to bring it full circle, that's one of the things I'm really excited to watch this launch with Justin. Justin has spent 10 years with one goal, which is everyone in his life should feel like they owe him a favor. Like that is the <laughs> driving thing at all times. And this is the project where he's going to cash them all in at once. And I, and I, I certainly hope, man, dude, I'm so excited. It, it does help that the product is absolutely stellar. It is fast. It is amazing. It's with any luck, fingers crossed the serial of, Pod, uh, of, of politics and um uh I, I i i can't wait to very loudly promote the hell out of it yeah. uh yeah you know look it's um it's obviously been a labor of uh, uh of, of of love throughout uh trying to put it together it's something that i'm personally uh very fascinated by uh, yeah, you know i i so far i've been very happy because uh, i haven't gotten well, it, it it makes me happy and wary that I have not gotten a ton. The show comes off as as authoritative enough and researched and scholarly enough that I have not gotten the 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 history pendants uh, kind of feedback. I know that the bigger this gets, if, if if this gets as big as I want it to be, that's going to be the stuff that I'm gonna have to deal with the most. Is the like, wow. Really, uh, it was the, the the this reaction, I mean, not the that. You, you you do realize that that's gold in the making because when they when the history pendants come for you and they will come for you, congratulations. That is the pay per view special in which you get to respond to all of them. That is the extra bonus features. That is a standalone extra two dollars. Uh, yeah, yeah, what yeah. Have I you. mean, uh, I'm, you know, uh, at this point, I think I'm probably more reticent about it because uh I'm in, a, I'm in an emotionally vulnerable spot trying to get all this stuff kind of done and out the door so uh uh i'm doing my best i i snapped at ashley today while we were walking i was walking her to the to the uh the the bus so she can go to bart or whatever and she's like she's like well you know like uh uh if you find something that you really think would make the show better uh you could you could always bump the release date Nope. And I like, I like, 
I like tensed up and like, you know, I was like, like, what the, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, well, no, actually, no, that would, that, that is a lie. I did not react in anger. I react, I reacted in total, uh, uh, just like shattered, vulnerable. I'm like, wait, do you not think it's, cause she's heard it all. I'm like, do you, do you not think it's good enough? Like, do I need to delay it? Like, like, why would you say that? Why on earth would you say that I should delay it for another Dude. week? And she's, and she's just like being a good wife, being a very supportive wife, somebody that's been with me through every kind of big project that I've launched and the ones that have gone better than expected, the ones that have not gone as good as expected. She was just like, well, you're just really stressed right now. Like, I just want to let you know that it's like, and I had to explain to her via text. I'm just like, it, it was all of your instincts were totally genuine and I appreciate them and I love them. But like, you cannot tell me that I should move this deadline. Back because <laughs> it is like, I, that is I, like telling, telling a, a Baptist preacher that like, well, maybe God doesn't exist. You ever thought of that? <laughs> like, I, uh, I've been on all sides of that, all sides of that. in that, that, that moment where, you know, you just, the the thing that is correct and right, but you're just emotionally, you know. So so I mean, so look, and look, like all of a sudden, if uh, I, I actually, uh, uh, I'll say this: I've not read the email yet, but uh, I I I just saw sitting in my email is an email back from uh, Hardcore History's Dan Carlin, Ooh. Uh, who I emailed. Uh, I did a a thing that uh, uh, I took a page from Brian's book of writing kind of unapologetic fan letters. And so there were a few people that specifically inspired Raise the Dead. And I specifically knew the elements that I treasured from their work and wanted to tell them that uh, while also just letting them know that there was a thing that they inspired. Uh, and uh, uh, let's say I click on that email, I open it up and Dan Carlin's like, oh, yeah, that's really, really good. You want to know what? Like, I'd be very interested if it went into something that, like, was very compelling. Then I would think about, oh, crap, this would probably only take me a week and I could make this better. Uh, so now maybe maybe I reconsider doing the ebook and audiobook on launch. Maybe I push those a little bit. I release the first episode and, and, and go ahead with that. But otherwise, man, you... <laughs> If you don't have a North Star and you don't believe that that North Star is is the truth, then uh, it's hard to get big stuff done, especially when you are the the primary motivator. And that's something where I think, you know, Brian, you have built around you a a team, right? Bryce and Brant, uh, they are are ultimately the ones saying like, and and Jason are are ultimately the ones saying like, hey, uh. You know, we have uh, you know run out of episodes. So what's good? Saturday is Saturday good? Is Friday good? Is Thursday good that we're shooting? And you can you can be part of the system where it's like ah, guess I gotta make the donuts today. Let me go research what I need to do and then show up to the uh, show up to the shoot and do it. Where Andrew, if you don't get up and write, nothing gets written. If you don't get up and 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 promote. Nothing gets promoted. And that's like, I, I know from your per, your system, when you were writing as a totally independent author, uh, getting it done and, and, uh, uh, and knowing that like, hey, look, judgment day is coming and the Lord will come and ask what you have done for him. And you better have a project that you are happy with to hand over because guess what? The Lord shows up on December 5th, no matter what. And it's going to be whether or not you disappoint him or not. Uh, no. All right. Two, two things to wrap everything up. Number one, release, release, even if flawed, learn from what you do. Yeah. You'll have another at bat. Uh, 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 no one moment will define you. Instead, you're going to do a bunch of mixed metaphors, scratch off lottery tickets. One of them may end up making you a millionaire. Mm -hmm. Number two, uh, all of our picks are, uh, there's nothing you could do right now, but decide in your heart right now to join the publicity brigade that will happen. Yes. When, yeah, when it, we it, launch it, Raise it, the Dead. If, if, if you do not subscribe to the Politics, Politics, Politics podcast, subscribe to that right now. Uh, this will come out uh, on that feed. Uh, a, a version of the first episode. In fact, 
In fact, yeah, yes. let, let, let's put the, the trailer at the end of this. Once we wrap up, we'll go straight into the trailer. Is that cool? Sure. Yeah. That's, I mean, I guess we can run it both weeks or whatever, but, but yeah, no, totally. I mean, the only thing is that the trailer is also calls to action to things that aren't set up yet. Oh, so never maybe, mind. We, yeah, yeah, we can launch. Uh, we can launch that next week when everything. Just is get ready. ready. Sign sign up on a bunch of mailing lists. Sign up. Sign up. Oh uh, yeah, uh, freepoliticalnewsletter uh, dot com. Uh, sign up for politics, politics, politics. You will hear the episode that Brian heard. Uh, that uh, I badgered Brian into into listening, and and he listened to one episode, and and then was very excited for the rest. It's great. And so you will it's hear great. that one it's episode. Great. They're all. It's great. They're great. All right, look, let's let's wrap it up because I want to hear what Dan Carlin said to you. <laughs> picks, picks, picks. Uh, I I, I do have pick. a very very brief pick. Uh, what you do is who you are by Ben Horowitz, uh, New York Times bestselling author, uh, created multiple businesses. He talks about how rhetoric is destroyed by your actions and you can talk about your corporate values of your company but if you're a leader your team will pick up on the cues that you indicate so you could say yeah for example i think uber recently rewrote their corporate statement with some version of of you know, we do the right thing period and he sort of takes that to task he's like what does that even mean you know, it's like uh, do the right thing for the quarterly revenues, to do the right thing for morality, do the right thing for individual writers or for shareholders or what. Uh, instead, um, basically, actions speak louder than words. And if you're the kind of uh, person, if you're the kind of leader who can turn down money or to go to your board uh, and I don't know, we don't have a board, so this is all me learning this stuff. But if you can go to your board and explain why we're about to all lose a lot of money because I made this specific promise and I don't want to be the kind of leader that breaks promises, then uh, that will yield you more benefits in the long term than doing what you know, you know, being a little soft on you know, the truth or whatever. Uh, and, and all of that rang true for me because the only resource we have at scam stuff, the only resource we have when it comes to diamond club or our fan base and, you know, night, night attack and, and even, you know, the, the modern road YouTube crew is that, um, uh, the only resource we have is the goodwill of our, of our viewers. And it is morally incumbent both on a personal level and on a business level to maximize all of that by being consistent and uh and making sure your actions back up your words i thought it was it, I, I enjoyed it quite a bit he wrote the hard thing about hard things which is a great book which is cited by a lot of people in business building is you know the 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 go-to book for understanding kind of the real work on that so uh he's great bryce uh, uh, there's a new Pokemon game out and I don't normally like those games, but I think this one's pretty good and there are a lot of cute creatures in it. So Pokemon sword or shield. How about that? Uh, talk about a show that I very much appreciate. Uh, it, despite the fact that it has a terrible name and an even worse theme song, uh, it is the toys that made us. Oh, wow. Uh, oh. I love the editing on there. And uh, it, it is so well done. It is so fun. Uh, uh, it, it, is, it is rare that a show can be kind of as silly as it is uh, while also uh, delivering a ton of really, really great factoids on uh, the kind of business relationship between these toy companies and the content that that kind of uh, drove them as well as sort of a, a path through uh, the the you know uh, the people that made a lot of the stuff that I was uh, you know into as a child so there are four new episodes up on Netflix we watched the first two of them Ashley and I uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Power Rangers uh, and you find out all sorts of crazy stuff including the fact that the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles theme song, right? Iconic. Uh, every time that there is spoken dialogue in that, do you know whose voice that is? 
That is a uh, uh, Big Bang Theory creator Chuck Lorre. Wait, I'm sorry. What? So he's like, yeah. he's a radical rat. Like that. That's yep. <laughs> that's Chuck Lorre. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> uh, but it gets all into kind of where. Uh, but uh, the one thing that's really, really good about the series is that when it, it it does not shy away from a lot of the emotional beats of it, and uh, the Ninja Turtles one specifically. Uh, talks about the estrangement of Eastman and Laird, the the two guys that initially created Ninja Turtles, and I think it handles those emotional beats exceptionally well. Uh, if you want an example of how to make real stories with really complicated and times esoteric elements compelling, fun, and real, Toys That Made Us, despite the fact that it's a terrible title, is really, really, really good. Excellent. My pick is all things Justin Robert Young. Freepoliticalnewsletter.com. Just sign up. Look, it'll only take you a couple of seconds, and you will be kept up to date with all of Justin Robert Young's latest dealings. Uh, you're already a one-way friend with Justin Robert Young. Why not make it a two-way friendship by joining us over at freepoliticalnewsletter.com? Yay. Thank you. It's been after. Did it say it loud enough? Dude, I'm so no, excited. We're good. Justin, it's oh. I'm I'm so excited for your launch. This is gonna be great. I'm I'm I mean, and even if it's not great, it's gonna be great that you've now <laughs> Come on. I, I mean that sincerely. Like like we've got a great no, plan B right. set up for you. No, 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 no. Here's my point <laughs> is is let's say you worked your whole life to uh make it to major league baseball and you stand up and your first at bat you strike out guess what you just had an at bat in major league baseball and uh, uh host, it's see, not going to be the only one you get no there's there's already so much that that i uh i mean the fact it number one the podcast the brazen the dead podcast already made the the politics 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 podcast infinitely better like if you have listened to that show uh and you have heard the changes that have gone on, uh, it, know that if you liked those changes and you appreciated why they were done, he will like Raise the Dead because many of them were done where lessons learned from the that production. Um, and yeah, and I know how to do it now. You know, if this is a success, then there will be a budget where I I I might bring somebody else on because now I know how to organize a story. Well, and how to... not only that, but, but anybody who wants to, who's kind of on the fence about like, this is a great idea. Sounds like, you know, you're doing like, it matters that you ship product and the product doesn't have to be great. The first product I shipped on YouTube was Brian Brushwood on the road, which are objectively bad videos, but it was shipped product that showed me trying to be a host. And that's, I'm convinced what got me the gig uh, for scam school that led to a lot of other good stuff. All right, look, uh, uh, we got to wrap up. We got to wrap up because yep. I want to hear about this. I want to hear this art. <laughs> this. We got to go. Thank yeah. you, everybody. Don't, for. Don't... Uh, no, go ahead. Oh, no. Thank you, everybody, for watching. We'll be back in a couple hours with Cord Killers with Justin Robert Young. Hey, it's that guy. He's going to give. He's gonna make the, the Watchman rant, and that'll be fun. Do the thing. That'll be fun to see. All right, everybody. We'll see you in not too very long. Why is this song so quiet? Bye, everybody. Uh, uh, uh.